Thank you, Manuel. Now we will continue this. Bienvenue. Yeah. With Jesus Gonzalez, the director of our institute. Please. Okay. Hello. Well, welcome, everyone. It is really a pleasure to host this wonderful meeting. I'm just going to give you, you know, a short welcoming and introduction of the Instituto de Astronomía de la UNAM. Next one, please. <laughs> okay, the Instituto de Astronomía uh, basically has two headquarters in Mexico City and uh, in Ensenada, Baja California, and runs two observatories, uh, the San Pedro Mater Observatory in Baja California and the Oan and Sintla in Puebla. The next one. Well, the academic personnel, we have about 80 astronomy professors, uh, 50, around 15 in Mexico City and 30 in Ensenada. We also have a large group of uh, very highly qualified technicians, both in, say, in, in Mexico City and, and Ensenada and in Tonantzintla. We have uh, a large number of postdocs, also well distributed between the two uh, sites. And we have also uh, a large group of, uh, of associated studies, uh, students, mostly graduate students, in both um, uh, cities. Of course, we have a large administrative uh, staff that actually is uh, responsible for running not only the, the headquarters, but also the observatories. And of course, as you may know and find out through this conference, we are, have a staff that basically covers a wide range of astronomical areas and instrumentation. The next one. Okay, uh, at San Pedro Martir, we have our main observatory uh, that was basically, uh, that for several years have uh, three main optical telescopes uh, equipped with a good uh, suite of, inst of instruments, mostly for the visible uh, optical or infrared. The next one. And of course, uh, more recently, through, uh, in, in, the last, in, the, in the last years, we have been pushing uh, forward to uh, uh, making it international uh, through projects of different uh, scales, also uh, modernizing the infrastructure. And of course, with uh, a very good uh, set of selected partners, we are running um, new, uh, new projects, telescope and instruments with uh, a large number of partners and ranging from small uh, dedicated instruments all the way to a 6.5 meter telescope that is uh, on, on in the final stages of its design. The next one, please. Of course, we also have uh, very powerful computational resources, both uh, centralized by UNAP and uh, in the Institute, both in Ensenada and, and, and Mexico City, a uh, large number of uh, more and sophisticated uh, labs, both in optics, electronics, and mechanical work in also both sides. And uh, we also are part uh, of foreign national observatories, both in Mexico and abroad, in particular a large uh, antenna, uh, a 50 millimeter, a 50 uh, meter, a millimeter antenna, and the high altitude water sharing cup experiment in Puebla, and together with the University of uh, Florida and Spain were partners of the 10.4 meter telescope in the Canary Islands. The next one, please. So with this very short introduction of who we are, uh, we, we, I want to welcome you to the Instituto de Astronomía. Of course, we feel very honored to participate in the celebration of the scientific career of Gary Ferland. And uh, I'm sure that we will have a very successful meeting and that Mexico City and the weather also helps you, to you for to have a very enjoyable week in Mexico City. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Now, continuing with this welcome, we have a few words from William Lee, we, who was our former director, and now he is the dean of science in the UNAM. Good morning. I'm happy to be home. Thank you for the welcome. Um, I will keep it short, since I was told the other day I, was, I had inaugurated the era of very short speeches, so I will keep it very short. Welcome, it's very, uh, it's very nice to have you all here. Uh, Gary, welcome, it's a pleasure. Um, I would just like to say a few words to compliment what the director has already said. 
The, this institute has been, uh, because of its development and history, a very important piece in the development of astronomy and astrophysics in Mexico uh, over many decades. And um, it has played a role in the development of observatories in Mexico and is still playing such a role. And it's, uh, it's relevant. It also played a very important role in the creation of a new group of astronomy and astrophysics in the country. Uh, many, if not most, of the other research institutes in Mexico at private and public universities or uh, centers that depend on the central federal administration uh, came from uh, this institute. So I think that's, that's quite relevant. Uh, the institute has also pushed for the development of uh, formation of human resources through graduate programs and uh, new areas in, in astrophysics besides the one that gave it strength in the early years. And Jesus talked about some of those in terms of, for example, the High Altitude Water Cherenkov Observatory uh, and other projects that are ongoing. But I think that the, this meeting particularly brings out one area in which the Institute has been very strong for a very long time, namely clouds of all types and sorts, sometimes water vapor, although not always. Um, and, and I think it's particularly fitting that this meeting be held here to honor Gary. Uh, I didn't realize that the world tour has been ongoing for such a diversity of longitudes. Looks like you need some diversity and latitude. but. Um, uh, I think that this is a, a very relevant place, and I'm very happy to see friends from other uh, longitudes and latitudes visiting here for the meeting. Um, so I think that you will have a, a very successful meeting, obviously, with such a crowd, um, and I wish you all the best. I think that the strengthening of this area in the Institute over the past few years is also ensuring that it will keep going as such for a very long time and surely leading to development and the strengthening of this area, but the development of new ones as it has in the past. I see no reason why it should be otherwise. So thank you all very much. Welcome, and I wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you, William. Then we are going to have a five minutes break and to recombine in five minutes. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. Estamos muy bien. Okay. Okay, we please here back at 9.30 to start the academic meeting. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. You can go enjoy the rain, enjoy the sight, whatever. ¿Cómo estás, Gusto de verte. Qué bueno.
I've already checked, this works fine. Para que sepa que son todos atrás. Maybe I should Is your power? It's going to It's going to give me. Two delay and two draw second. Give me change. I'll put that on when it's ready. Yep. Okay. I'll put. Yep. That'll be good. Thank you. Speak English. Speak English, right? Okay. Yeah. Speak into it. Okay. Okay.
Ultra vest. Okay, please, please take your seats. I have no mic. Hi. Uh, please take your seats. We're going to start this meeting. Our first sponsor is Gary Ferland. Remind himself. Please applaud him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank okay. you very much. I want to begin by thanking our local host for, for being so gracious. Manuel uh, gave a beautiful introduction. Sylvia and Manuel have done such a superb job, and the others here at the Institute. Uh, so it's very typical of the hospitality of Mexico. I've enjoyed my extended visits both here in Morelia very, very much. So I want to thank you very, very much. Now, if you sit here and you look uh, at the talk, uh, you might be some trepidation. You're going to hear about talk about something that happens 40 years ago. Now, my good friend Martin Ward likes to say that when you get to this age, you proceed in your anecdotage, where you stop doing research, but rather talk about things that you used to do a very long time ago. Uh, it's not real. It's a lot of that's going to happen here. I want to talk, talk to you about something that was very exciting that happened to a very young person, but also it was the, the it, it led to the, the creation of Cloudy. And then the, the uh, second thing I want to begin with is a very old, old saying. I first heard it from Joe Miller 30 years ago. I don't know how far I go back it goes. But the spectrum is indeed how we find out about the cosmos. When you look at the spectrum, you're dealing with photons that last interacted with matter perhaps halfway across the universe. And they're carrying with them the message of the place where they came. And this is the best way we can understand what happened out there. So just to uh, talk about some background on this, uh, this thing, uh, ANOVA, and I'm going to talk about a, what's called a classical NOVA. ANOVA is a binary star system in which uh, white dwarf, the star shown on the right here, a collapsed object, is very close to a main sequence star, which is uh, be either beginning to leave the main sequence or perhaps its orbit has changed, and its outer its outer layers are being pulled onto the, onto the white dwarf, forms an accretion disk, and then eventually the material lands on the surface of the white dwarf. So the surface of the white dwarf has no hydrogen. The core of the white dwarf has no hydrogen, but the material that's 
coming from its companion is very, very hydrogen rich. And so this, this is uh, uh, a selection of white dwarfs that you may use as a target. But what, what's going to happen in a nova explosion is the, the layers of gas will, will land on the surface, eventually become very, very compressed, very hot, and a thermonuclear runaway happens. So if you were to, uh, to look at this, uh, these are all thanks to Google Images. Uh, the, the, the sequence of events that would happen in a nova explosion is there's a, uh, in number one, there's the companion dumping material onto the white dwarf. It goes through an accretion disk, except that's not what happened, uh, it turns out. But I'll get to that at the end. And then uh, the layer ignites and the whole thing uh, blows up. I was very, very fortunate when I was in graduate school to spend a week with Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin. Uh, when she was extremely elderly, she was in her 80s at that time, and I was at the very beginning of my career. To, to put this in context, she was an undergraduate student at Cambridge and studied with, with uh, Eddington at the turn of the century. Uh, she was the one who named many of the things that we take for granted today. And I, in conversation, she mentioned that uh, uh, she, she was very interested in, in Novi when she was young, they, the class of stars didn't have a name, and she was trying to think of a name to, to give this class of stars. And she said she first thought she would, would call them catastrophic variables. And then, uh, then she thought for you know, a while that it, it, a catastrophe sounds like it's, you know, once it would end everything. Uh, she said was, wasn't, she wasn't sure that whatever happened here was a catastrophe, but certainly was a cataclysm. So she decided to call them cataclysmic variables. And so, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the very person that, that actually thought up the, the, the word of, 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 of uh, the, the names of the stars. So what happens if eventually, if you wait long enough, you can see the expelled material that blows off from the nova. And so here's two novae. Uh, the one on the left exploded in 1934, the one on the right in 1901. And so these are photos uh, showing the, the material that was expelled at that time, the central object in the center. So it was indeed, it was not a catastrophe, it was a cataclysm. The star is still down there in the center, and it's thought that these happened every 100,000 years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years. There's still some argument about how often these, these things recur. Okay, so that's the background. So where did I come in? So I, in, in the middle of summer of 1975, there was, a, there was a survival skill as a graduate student at the University of Texas that if you needed support over the summer, uh, you could get three months of telescope time over the summer at McDonald's because it's always cloudy in the summer. And, and so you just go up there, and it was fantastic. Before the invention of the Internet, uh, the dome on the left uh, was a telescope that had a giant library in the bottom, so you, it was just a huge astronomical library. And I was... Uh, at this time on the, the smallest telescope, this one right there. And what happened was that the observatory got a, a phone call from Gerard de Vaucouleur, who was walking his dog in his backyard or something, and noticed that there was a bright new star in the sky. And so he phoned the observatory and said, uh, everybody's got to look at this bright new star. There's something new and bright that's up there. Now, that turns out that's extremely challenging. If you we look up in the sky, so here's, here's Cygnus. Uh, so there's a Dena of Alpha Sig right there. So that's an easy constellation to pick out. It's the Northern Cross. You can uh, uh, find that without too much effort. And then this is uh, the same thing. So there's Dena, a uh, uh, slightly different angle, but I've registered these as close as you can, as I could. So here's, uh, here's Dena here. Here it is here. And this is taken at the time. And there was a great big bright star, almost as bright as Dena, right there in the sky. Now. That is a great challenge in itself. Uh, you've got a star in the sky, and you want to point a telescope at it, a big telescope. Uh, that, that is a challenge. You don't know the coordinates. And the way this works is since you, everybody uses coordinates, uh, nobody had ever bothered to line up the finder scopes on any telescopes at McDonald's. And none of the finder scopes worked. So you just had these giant telescopes that could see a little tiny piece of the sky. And the job then was try to point one of these telescopes at that bright light. So I finally got the littlest telescope at McDonald to point at it, and we got coordinates off that. That went to the next biggest, and finally uh, we got the biggest telescope at McDonald to point at it. 
And if you're you know, a young person, so there you are, uh, I was in my mid-20s, I suppose, and suddenly there's a bright, a bright light in the sky. No idea what it might be. We, we had the notion maybe it was a supernova. Uh, nobody had any idea what that is, but what you're standing right next to is a telescope with a spectrometer. And so what you can do is point this telescope at that light in the sky and get a spectrum. They have no idea what that spectrum is going to be like. You have absolutely no idea what it's going to be like. Uh, I, I'm going to show you some spectra in just a second. Nova Sig was, uh, uh, it was very fortunate Nova to be studying. It was a good, clean bang. Uh, this is a light curve from a paper I did later. So it, the thing blew up and it, it didn't waste any time and it just faded away very, very quickly. So it's just a, a, a good, clean bang. Many classical novae don't do this. They, they remain bright for months at a time, and there's a lot of continued mass loss. It gets very, very complicated because of all the, the things with, with evolving mass loss. Uh, that's not what happened here. Uh, the, the, so those details, the novae are different. It has to do with the composition of the white dwarf, the, the mass of the white dwarf, uh, are, are the things, that, the ingredients that lead to the type of a nova explosion. But this nova, uh, it was a good, clean bang. It got to be one of the brightest stars in the sky. It was turned out it was a couple of kiloparsecs away, very heavily reddened. If it hadn't been uh, for the reddening, it would have been the brightest thing in the sky uh, by far. Uh, so it, it faded away uh, over a period of time. So what happened was the director of McDonald Observatory, Harlan Smith, got very excited about this. and. And he made the largest telescope at McDonald, a dedicated observatory, to, to follow this light curve. And I was at the same time at the smaller telescope, and then the challenge was to use uh, spectrophotometry from the, from the small telescope to calibrate the spectra that came off from the big telescope at a time long before there was any reduction software. All this software, all this, the data had to be reduced using Fortran programs that you wrote using Hollerith cards. I mean, so that was, there's nothing like these interactive GUIs that you, that you had today. So what happened? So it was a good, clean bang. It started, it must have gone off on about uh, that date. White Dwarf exploded. It was a cataclysm, not a catastrophe. The White Dwarf will explode again sometime in the future. It ejected a shell of gas at very, very high speed and uh, with line center that was beyond the escape velocity of the galaxy. So that told you that the, the line center of the emission lines uh, was not really the systemic velocity because it, it would not be in the galaxy. It would have escaped. That was the first clue to, to some really bizarre things about the star that was only understood much, much later. So the gas expanded and moved away from the white dwarf uh, the, uh, the emitting gas, the spectros what is, should be called the spectroscopically active gas, the gas you actually noticed, had a mass of about uh, the mass of Jupiter. And so that's the downside of novae. They're not very important in the big picture. That's not much mass. They return a lot of material from the, from the outer white dwarf, a lot of carbon, uh, things like oxygen. But the mass budget is pretty small. They don't actually amount to very much. Uh, given these numbers. So what happened is that the spectrum shows what happens if you blow up a dense shell of gas, blow it out into space, and it moves away from the exploding white dwarf and becomes more dilute. So a good clean bang, and you can watch what happened. Now just to, you know, if, you, if you can imagine this, uh, there's a new light in the sky. You're standing next to a telescope with a spectrometer. You eventually get the telescope pointed at this new light in the sky, and you get a spectrum. You have no idea what you're going to see, a power law continuum. You can see emission lines, absorption lines, or what. Uh, th this is actually the observed spectrum. It's heavily reddened, so it was not dereddened here. So this is the spectrum of a B star, a late B star. You can see a, a mild bomber jump uh, here. Now, the problem with spectra is there's nothing as boring as listening to a spectroscopist talk about his spectrum. Because you know the spectrum, this is an, you know a spectrum is an is an old old friend. The details of the, the the different emission features are things you've worked with for ages and ages. You know every single wavelength by heart, and so to to a spectroscopist, nobody can be uh, m more excited about anything than their spectrum. 
And then to anybody else in the whole world, this is, this is really dull. I mean, there's a bunch of bobs and things going on. But anyway, so what, this, what is this? It's a, it's a B star. So there's sort of a bomber jump there. You've got absorption lines. Uh, this stuff out here is uh, absorption from the, from the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Now, there has to be a little bit of old curmudgeon in this talk. Uh, looking back, uh, the way we had it then, compared to now, things used to be really great. Spectrometers used to work in the UV. So we just took it for granted that we would get this part of the spectrum. That part of the spectrum is mostly lost today. You're not going to get time with space telescope to, uh, to look up here because you can see it from the ground, and then the optics and modern spectrometers don't transmit here. So we've lost pretty much this whole part of the spectrum, but it was easily, easily done back, uh, back then. Uh, so what you're looking at is the spectrum of a dense shell of gas that's mimicking a photosphere, a pretty warm photosphere. And what I'm going to do, we didn't know this, of course, at the time, but I'm putting at the top some numbers of where this spectrum is. So at, the time, at this time, the radius of the shell was just about, about the radius of Mars. And uh, so the next number is the energy density temperature. So if you take the radiation field, luminosity of the white dwarf, and if you figure out uh, where the shell is, you can figure out the number of vergs per cubic centimeter, cubic centimeter per second. Uh, where the shell is produced for the radiation field from the central star, where that shell is. And then you can back that out and convert that into an equivalent black body temperature. This is called the energy density temperature. It's very important to understand how, how matter works. The energy density temperature here is about 14,000 Kelvin. So the gas, and the density of the gas was about a uh, little, little under 10 to the 6, 10 to the 11 uh, particles per cubic centimeter. So what uh, has happened, this is dense enough and hot enough that it looks like a, a, a B star. Now the next day, you go back and look at it again, completely different spectrum. Uh, so this is the next day. It's uh, no longer a B star. Uh, the strongest single line is H alpha. So the shell has moved out, so it's now about the radius of Jupiter. Uh, it's moved away from the central object, so the, so the, so the radiation field striking it is, is more dilute, so the, uh, and the, the density has gone down. So this so is a remarkably different spectrum just looking at it. So what, what, what the story here is a shell of gas is becoming dilute as it expands, and, this, and it moves away from the central object, so the radiation field striking it is uh, uh, becoming more and more tenuous. So this is now... Uh, Several days later, we had a remarkable clear spot in, uh, at McDonald. Now that we've moved out uh, almost to Saturn's orbit, the density has fallen down, the temperature has fallen down. So we're now at the parameters that are the density and energy density of the broadline region of an AGN, although I didn't know that at the time. And if you look at this spectrum, what you've got here is an AGN spectrum. So you've got... Uh, uh, a, a typical quasar spectrum. The strongest lines are hydrogen lines, overwhelmingly strong iron-2 lines. So iron-2 is a grand challenge problem. It's got thousands of energy levels. Uh, it's a very abundant element. And for most conditions, because of the way the ionization potentials work out, for many conditions, iron will be singly ionized. So there's lots and lots of iron emission here. Uh, but see, the underlying continues. No hint of a star. Uh, this straight line... Uh, is, is the fit from uh, recombination continuum of hydrogen. So, uh, so this is a mix of, this, so the, it's now optically thin, and you're looking at an optically thin shell of gas, lots and lots of emission. It continues to move out, so this is now sort of in the middle of, the equivalent of the inner, middle of the broadline region. Uh, I promise not to uh, dwell on any spectra, lots of, I, of iron two emission through here. This line is very remarkable. This is an 80, oxygen 1, 84-46. You can see it's the second strongest line in the spectrum. That's produced by a, resonance fluores a fluorescence effect where Lyman beta of hydrogen fluoresces O1. So it's, it's an indication of strong radiative transfer effects that are going on inside this cloud. Uh, so the density has fallen, the energy density has fallen. We're still something like the, uh, a, a quasar. Now, finally, we're getting to a low enough density, it's 10 to the 8th, 
that we can start to see the oxygen forbidden lines here, the, the O3, 5007, 49, 59. They're strongly suppressed at these high densities, but there's a lot of oxygen in the shell, and as the density goes down, we're starting to see uh, emission. Another thing you'll notice is what Payne Gaposchkin called castellated structure. I asked her why she called it that, and she said it reminded her of an English castle. So the emission lines are starting to, to uh, develop the, the, the very famous castellated structure. They, that's the formation of clumps in the, uh, in the ejecta. And go on down. So this is now October. Uh, the, uh, the program is going on. The castellated structure is very present. There's the, the old one line, uh, mostly uh, very strong permitted lines. Uh, we're almost done here. We're now in November. The, the shell is becoming lower and lower density. You notice the O3 forbidden lines are becoming stronger relative to H beta. That's because they're less collisionally suppressed as the density falls down. So we're now talking about a density of uh, 30 million or so particles per cubic centimeter with the energy density temperature that's below 1,000 Kelvin. There's no particular reg region in a quasar that has these parameters, but uh, so this would be between, if you do quasars, between the broad line region and the narrow line region. But it's the same shell of gas. So this was the last of the high resolution spectra that were obtained. Uh, you can see the, the, the castellated structure is very, very well developed. And the, strong, the forbidden lines are becoming very strong. The strongest line now in the spectrum is the O3 fightable 7 line. So this is, uh, what this is, is a textbook example of what happens if you take a, a dense shell of gas and blow it up. And so these, are these dates here, so these are special energy distributions. The numbers indicate the day number. And so the, the, the first, so these are SEDs going across the, the, the UV optical into the infrared. Uh, there, there were data of that kind. Uh, so this is the first day we had complete data. And what you're looking at is a black body. So you have a ray genes tail and you have a vein tail over here. That's that spectrum of the B star. So what's happened here is the gas is very dense and uh, uh, is optically thick. It becomes optically thin first in the UV, uh, still optically thick in the infrared, uh, textbook signature of Brehm's absorption. By one month after, you're looking basically, this is F nu, at basically just uh, gaseous emission from an optically thin shell. And eventually, a year later, this, uh, you can actually see the, the, the white dwarf again. So this is the, the rated genes tail of a the very hot central star. So this is a, a textbook example of what happens when you take a dense shell of gas and let it explode. All the atomic physics, all the thermodynamics that happens as this, as this goes along. A lot of radio transfer effects are present. This is, this is showing first the castellated structure. So this is the, this is uh, H beta. And initially it's very, very smooth. And as it goes along, you can see uh, we switched to H alpha over here, but you can see the development of, of uh, it looks like four clumps here. At much higher resolution, you can see that the structure is much, much finer than that. So this very pronounced clumping develops in, in the shell. And it's not intuitive. You blow something to smithereens, why would it form clumps? But we'll see something in just a bit. So this, uh, there's that, but then there's very powerful radio transfer effects coming. Uh, you can see that the H alpha line is not symmetric. The, the, the shortward side is faint and the longward side is, is, is bright. Turns out that's because the lines are quite optically thick. And so the bomber lines will radiate predominantly back towards the central object. Very, is, this happens in quasars too. Uh, so if you, have a, if you have a shell coming towards you, if, if the emission lines are going back towards the central object, the blue shifted part will be faint. Then you see the far side moving away from you, then the, you can see the illuminated face of that looks very bright. And, that, and then the, the, the tilt changes in the GNOVA literature is called the V to R ratio, the violet to red ratio. They all do this. And so this is a signature of very powerful uh, rate of transfer effects going on. And then you can see the very strong iron two emission, uh, something that's also very, very strong in, in many, many quasars. Uh, this is the bomber decrement. So this is what's the, the H alpha line divided by H beta. Uh, normally in uh, dilute material, 
H alpha divided by H beta, those intensities would be 2.7. Uh, that's called case B, and it's a surprisingly robust prediction that the, the hydrogen emission should be close to case B. So this is the, the bomber decrement as a function of time. So it was moving all over the place, became very large, became very small. That's another indication of powerful rate of transfer effects that are going on inside the lines. Now, that was caused by a, a combination of the very strong radiation field striking the gas, but also the, the, the very high density of the gas. Then this uh, line I was pointing to is, a, this is called the Bowen 01 fluorescence mechanism. So here's, high, this is H alpha. Here's this strange 01 line, 8446. And this is uh, a picture from one of the figures from, from Osterbach and Furland showing hydrogen here, Lyman beta, and then it fluoresces through this and makes 8446 here. And the second strongest line in, in the spectrum. Uh, uh, exotic rate to transfer effects. Well, it's part, so the first thing we were after was trying to figure out physical conditions and it's, it's sort of a uh, density and temperature. And there's very, very classical use of all the forbidden lines that anybody working with gaseous nebulae would, would have used. So this is the 5 to 7 to 40 63 ratio. So this is the main O3 line to uh, the auroral line ratio. That's the primary temperature diagnostic in, in planetary nebulae in H2 regions. And so you can see early on, this is log time and days, the density was so high that the O3 was thermalized. And it's actually telling you the true temperature. You, you could use a Boltzmann equation to get a temperature. It's about 9,000 Kelvin. And then it, when after about a month or so, the density has fallen enough that it's moving away from the critical density of 4063 and the ratio starts to, to, to rise up. So this becomes a density indicator. You can, you can tell how dense the gas was at this point. This is a different ratio. This is, this is the oxygen divided by uh, neon three. So these have different critical densities. So you can, you can use this as a, as a density diagnostic. There's various games you can play with the emission lines in, in the spectrum to try to tease out the density and temperature of the shell. Uh, so this shows the uh, electron temperature on the left, this is log time after outburst. So this is roughly the first year uh, after the emission lines had developed, not the, not the time when it was in absorption lines. So initially, the kinetic temperature was a little under 9,600, and then started to fall. That was caused by the low density. Uh, the shell could, could, uh, could, could uh, uh, cool very effectively, so its kinetic temperature fell. And you can see that the density is falling off as roughly a power law. So the emission lines are first seen when the density was a couple hundred million, and we followed it through with the first year. Uh, the, the density had fallen to uh, to about 10 million. So a big uh, a big goal was to figure out the composition of, of this ejected gas. So this, this shows uh, the last column shows the Nova's composition relative to the Sun. So iron and helium have about solar abundances, but the heavy elements are enhanced by order of magnitude. So that's, that's reflecting uh, the, the, the dredging of material from the accretion onto the white dwarf with the white dwarf material. Uh, anytime you do a spectroscopic observation, you're committing a systematic error because you, your spectrometer can only detect uh, the light that that material, the, the spectrometer can only detect the material that can emit this, what the spectrometer can develop, can, can actually see. So in, with visible light, it's very, very hard. It's impossible to see gas at 100 Kelvin, and it's very challenging to see gas at a million Kelvin. Uh, so David Lambert, uh, so I very, I very happily fell in, in league with uh, David Lambert, uh, who's here today. Uh, this was a really great idea when the thing had absorption lines, but it turns out David knows everything about spectroscopy, and then, uh, then also Greg Shields. Uh, so one thing David noticed uh, was that the O1 rate lines, or H alpha, didn't have the three to one ratio. And so that was due to iron tin being blended with O1. So this is a, a uh, spectrum from a paper uh, David wrote very graciously, put me as first author. I didn't understand why he did that, but uh, he, he could see the, 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 that there was very strong iron tin emission under the O1. 
At the same time, there's, a, there's iron 11. So these are called coronal lines because they're seen in the corona of the sun. And there's some hint of this. The, the line profile doesn't look like the O3, so the hot gas. So this, this iron 10 would be coming from gas with a million Kelvin. Very, very hard to detect million degree gas with an optical spectrometer. On the right is a fit from a paper to the SED. So th this is the observed special energy distribution the, from the UV to the infrared. So this is what you would see. Uh, so th this is the breakdown of what's in there. There's the hot black body from the central star. There's the uh, cool gas emitting this, but then about half of the continuum you see is actually coming from, t uh, from million degree gas. Uh, so there's a, a phase there that is very, very difficult to, to uh, work with if you have only optical data. Today, of course, they, they see this all the time in the x-rays. NOVI, our fantastic laboratory, this was uh, I, I just going to go off on two different NOVI. NOVA SIG didn't do these things. Uh, it's known that NOVI have uh, electronic absorption lines of CN near maximum. That, that's coming from the shell. So there's molecules in the shell. And this was a... Uh, a, a nova that was observed, I believe, at Kitt Peak, uh, showing near-infrared first overtone carbon monoxide emission coming from that shell. Uh, so there's lots of molecules that form in the ejecta. Then uh, this is uh, the light curve for a nova that went off in DQ uh, in 1934, DQ Hercules. Uh, so this thing was one of the brightest stars in the sky for several months, and then uh, it, it dramatically dropped out of sight, 10 magnitudes, almost instantaneously. That was caused by the condensation of dust inside the, the Nova shell. That blocked the light of the uh, central star. Uh, Panga Poshkin told me a story. Uh, it was uh, very cloudy over the East Coast, and this star had been very, very bright uh, for many months. And she and Sergei Kaposhkin had gone camping in Maine. And she walked out from the campsite and looked up, and the Nova had disappeared. And so she tried to phone Harvard to get a Harvard circular that the star had disappeared. We had to go find the star. And so she wanted to make a collect phone call. So she had a British accent, and they refused to accept the call because they thought it was a joke that the brightest, some of the brightest star in the sky had disappeared. So she put Sergei on. So the guy with a Russian accent tried to explain that she was not kidding. The star had really disappeared. And so this was a dramatic, a rapid onset of... Uh, uh, of, of dust formation. Uh, Fred Hoyle in the 60s, uh, th th this began his interest in, in, in dust. Uh, uh, in the 60s, he's, he wrote papers with reclamacy and trying to figure out how you would condense uh, dust grains uh, in the middle of this. The, the, okay, 10 minutes. Radio transfer effects are very important in all of this, and the spectrum looks a lot like a quasar. So it turned out at about this time uh, Martin Rees got some money to support a postdoc uh, to observe quasars with IUE, a, a satellite. And so I was the person uh, who was working really hard on dense rate of transfer effects, iron two emission, steep bomb reductants, and all this. And so I, I got the postdoc at Cambridge. Now it was a fantastic experience for three reasons. First of all, Martin and I had a fantastic understanding. Martin Reese did not want to supervise a postdoc, and I did not want to be supervised. So we had a great understanding, but he was very supportive. He had the office right next door. Any questions about thermodynamics, system mechanics, he, he knew the whole thing. Alan Burgess was just down the street at, at Applied Maths. And then the big tuna, a train ride away, 75 minutes away, was Mike Seaton who was, uh, for some reason, took a liking to me. So he, he spent many an evening in a pub with Mike. A uh, great, a great, great atomic physicist. So, uh, what we know of atomic physics today would not be the same if, without Mike Seaton. And what I recall early in that time in Cambridge, a conversation, I, I can still recall the details. Uh, Martin was standing here. John Weisheit, who is now who had a long career at Livermore, uh, I don't know why he was at the Institute, but uh, he was standing next to Martin, and I was standing there. It was just after coffee time. And we started talking about the various things that could happen to it, the various thermodynamic limits of a shell of gas as, as, as it went very hot, very cold, very, very dense, very, very low density. So Martin really had the thermodynamics, physical mechanics. Uh, he knew all this. He also, he'd read Beta and Saltpeter, so he knew all about 
uh, quantum mechanics, but then Weisheit had a great deal of experience working with dense plasmas in the lab. And so I, I can see, we, we talked for several hours. I, I can still remember that conversation very clearly. It was 1978. And so, uh, this is a, a figure from the review article of Vista Americana. So this is the, uh, on the 2013 release of Cloudy. So this shows sort of the phase space as possible in, uh, in, th in material, uh, thermal matter. So the vertical axis shows the density. And so the density here is going from 10 to the minus 10 particles per cubic centimeter. The IGM has a density. The intergalactic medium is about here. And then you go up to densities of 10 to the 20th. And then the second parameter here is the energy density temperature. This was that TU that was been in these diagrams. So this is how dense the radiation field is that's striking it. And so these are various simple thermodynamic limits. Uh, thermo local thermodynamic equilibrium means the collisions are so fast, it sets up a kinetic distribution, Boltzmann distribution for the populations, even if the light is not in equilibrium. STE is strict thermodynamic equilibrium, means a black body a radiation field is a black body with the right shape, right intensity, and the, and the material is all in the equilibrium. Uh, different, so these are different uh, regions, the intergalactic medium. This is the molecular torus in AGN, the narrow line region, and the broad line region in AGN. So what the NOVA had done, so this was uh, showing the Cloudy can do all this. It took me, it took us, is that Cloudy is a team effort. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, Peter Van Hoff and Robin Williams have done a lion's share of what is today's Cloudy, and uh, Fran, Fran Guzman and, and Mario Hatzikos, still practicing the correct pronunciation after all these years, uh, uh, are carrying it on today. So it's very definitely a team effort. But this is what the, 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 the limits the code can do. So here it is. This is what Nova Sig did, that, that red cell. We saw material moving down like this across this diagram. So that much was fun, there's a lot of uh, things to understand. There's limits to what you can get out of spectroscopy. About 15 years later, it was discovered that this star was what's called an AM Her star. It has a fierce magnetic field, 10 to the 10, seven, uh, 10 to the 7 Gauss or so. And this field is so strong that it actually controls material accreting onto the white dwarf. And what almost certainly happened with that very, very powerful field is the nova explosion was not a, a 1D sphere, which is the way I always thought about it, but it actually was probably like a directed Star Wars energy beam attack on the second star directed by the magnetic field. Uh, that's probably why the lines were centered 300 kilometers per second off the rest velocity. And so, the, so this is a very strong magnetic field. So there are limits. There's no way without the polarization measurements that discovered that the star was an AM Hurst star. If in, you know, 1978 with optical spectra, if you said, I can then understand everything if I invoke a 10 to the seventh Gauss magnetic field to direct the ejecta as an energy beam towards the second star, uh, people would think you're nuts. It does explain, this, this is the, uh, the shell run GK PER, went off in 1901. This is what's really going on. So there's a central star. Uh, the, this, the blue is X-ray emitting light. This is one of these NASA composite images. So this is X-ray emitting light that was made the iron tin. And then you can see very, this is optical emission with HST. You can see the very powerful clumps that are formed. That's what made the castellated structure that Payne Kaposchkin had noticed all those years before. Almost certainly they're, they're formed by some kind of hydrodynamical instability as the hot gas uh, uh, flows past the filaments. Now, Robin Williams works on this kind of instability all the time, and he keeps trying to explain it to me, and I hope to understand it someday. Uh, the red is radio emission, synchrotron emission, caused by uh, the hot gas hitting the filaments. So there it is. So there it is, Nova Sig 70, 1975. It was a, uh, a tremendous roller coaster ride. I, I can't begin to say, tell you what it was like pointing a telescope at this thing every night, when, what am I going to see? What will the spectrum be? Especially the first night. What, what is this bright light in the star, in the sky? So what it was was a laboratory, what NOVA explosions are, is a laboratory to see all the range of things that can happen with thermal material as they initially is very optically thick to free-free absorption, Brim's absorption, forms a photosphere, 
uh, becomes transparent, uh, makes lots of emission lines. Many of them make molecules. They know how to make dust almost overnight. And uh, some of the things are, are mysteries today. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for some interesting. Have time for questions? <laughs> we were <work. laughs> when, when did you stop observing uh, directly, or are you still an observer, Gary? Are you still an observer, or just well, no, a theoretician? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you that story. So I got to Cambridge, and uh, supposed to work on AGNs, and Bob Carswell got a night on the four meter at the AAT. And back then, you had to go to get the so-called Apex ticket. You had to go to Australia for two weeks. Now that's fun. You get, you know, they have a thousand poisonous snakes. They got, uh, uh, you know, you had to learn about Mitty and a schooner, but you could do that. Uh, so I had to go all, went all the way to Cambridge. Uh, so Bob Carswell went through Hong Kong. I came through the States because Sydney is just about as far from Cambridge as you can get, and. Uh, Got there for two weeks. There's no internet, so you, just, you know there's no way to get to your files. The night was a cloudy night, and so I saw the light. So I had Martin Reese as my next door neighbor. Alan Burgess and Mike Seaton were down the road. Theory makes a lot more sense than trying to uh, spend two weeks going halfway around the planet for a cloudy night on a on a telescope. So I left it to the professionals. I uh, began doing theory. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't believe you. <laughs> yes, please. Here's a theory question. It's something I already know and I just don't. When the Nova theory makes a lot more sense than trying to pose the question of whether you have to have some kind of a special kind of radiation The shell. Oh, it's definitely radiation pressure. That's very. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the shell is super metal rich. The, the, the heavy elements are up by order of magnitude. As much as anything else is because there's, lot, not, there's, a lot, there's not a lot of hydrogen that's mixed with the material in the, sea, in the, in the white dwarf. And so the, you know, the Eddington limit is electron scattering. These things are very, very metal rich. So the opacities are very, very high, even by a solar mixture. So the, these things are effectively super Eddington. They're blown out. Is radiator unstable with the ionization front? So that, that would be, yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Another good reason. Thank you. Deborah? Yeah. Gary, I want to ask you I, you know that I am an AGN person, but by chance I got to observe and do the work on the first NOVA that was observed on with IUE, mm -hmm. and uh, the spectrum turned out to be very, very rich. And I wanted to ask you if anyone has worked out the physics of the emission lines in the ultraviolet modeling, I mean, with cloudy. Now, I don't uh, know that. There have been a massive number of campaigns. Well, I think I do know that. Um, there have been a lot of, of studies of NOVI, most very recently in the last 20 years, the space telescope and also the X-ray observations and radio, and they do do a lot of modeling. So that I think I think those papers have done it. I'm not part of that effort, uh, so I, I think that has happened. Sorry, a, a short question. Uh, what do you know about the polarization of this kind of? Object? That's how the the polarization was a question. Uh, that's how the AM her nature of this was discovered. So nothing at the time was known. It couldn't make polarization measurements at that time. Uh, so it was it was 15 years later that Schmidt and others uh, detected the, the polarization as characteristic of an AM her star. So it was much it was much later. Uh, now the star is so faint that it's even with big telescopes today it, it can barely be seen. Well, we thank Gary again for this interesting talk, and we go to the next speaker. Okay, so, okay. Uh,
tell you what I am. I still sent you for this dog. Okay, our next speaker is Martin Ward. He's going to talk about Markarian 110. Okay. Markarian 110, a case study of set fitting and modeling of the coronal line emitting regions. An invited talk. Okay. So you need to finish? Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to add my thanks to the organizers, uh, Gary, of course, and the local organizers for inviting me here. I think it's only my second trip, no, my third trip to Mexico. Uh, the first one was Puebla, and the second one was um, Cancun, and so this is different from those. It's very nice to be here. Um, so just a quick word about where I'm from. I don't know whether many of you have been to Durham, but this is um, a picture of Durham, more or less from my house. It's a very old city. It has a thousand-year-old cathedral and uh, a castle. And if you want to know where it is in relation to other places in the UK, uh, this is Ireland here. It's uh, it got a bit chopped off, but that's because that's not part of the United Kingdom. There is uh, Ireland down here somewhere, but... Uh, <laughs> exactly. I'm coming to that, yes. So <laughs> this is where Durham is, up here quite near Scotland. Um, London down here, Cambridge here, Oxford over here, that's probably enough geography. So I guess most of you haven't uh, been there, but you may have heard of Durham in a different way, and that is this is um, the cloisters of the cathedral, and if you have children uh, of a certain age, then you may have heard of Harry Potter. And um, <laughs> one of the movies of Harry Potter was filmed in this cloister. I'm not sure which one, but uh, if you haven't heard of Durham, you will have heard of Harry Potter. Well, let's uh, continue now, and um, I'm actually very pleased to be here, but there's a lot of competition in astronomy conferences. Um, look at the dates here, the 8th to the 12th of August. In fact, I was on an aeroplane with my colleagues from Durham University who are organizing this with Dartmouth College coming over here. They went to Dartmouth, and I came here, um, and their title is Hidden Monsters, but I prefer my monsters to be up front, and I had a look around, and I found this one. So, um, <laughs> something to do with sheep, I believe, you can explain <laughs> later on. <laughs> so that's my monster, and I'm going to be talking about AGNs, and they're often referred to as monsters. I realized last night, I should have realized before, of course, that a large body of the audience, the majority probably, don't do active galactic nuclei for a living. And so, obviously, I don't have time to do a graduate course in these things. But I will try to avoid too much um, instant jargon and to give a very brief introduction as to where this um, detailed modeling, for which I can thank Gary, this project, which I will come to eventually, about Makarian 110, uh, to set the scene of how we got there. So I'm going to be talking about SEDs, spectral energy distributions of active galactic nuclei, and this rather complicated picture shows a schematic of the multi-frequency spectrum of an AGN, going from the radio way down here up to the hard X-rays here. Um, and it is a schematic, but of course some galaxies are radio loud, some are radio quiet, so there's a difference over here. Some of them are heavily reddened, and I'm not going to be talking about those, the so-called um, ultra-luminous infrared galaxies, for example. They may be the same underneath as what we see here, but because they're enshrouded in dust, we don't get a clear view. But I don't want to make life too difficult, so I'm going to be talking about unobscured AGN. Um, the various wavelengths here, infrared, and then beyond radio, up to the X-rays over here. So I'm focusing in this sort of region for my SED, because this is the region where the ionizing photons that produce the emission lines come from. The shaded region here, and I should have said this is a, a zero redshift object. I'm not, um, I'm mostly talking about low redshift objects. Of course, you can adjust where this SED appears observationally by going to higher and higher redshifts, but this is effectively zero redshift. You can see that rather unfortunately, but that's life, the peak of the energy distribution is in the shaded region, which is where we have no data. 
uh, because of photoelectric absorption um, in our galaxy. Uh, so that's bad news in a way. We have to infer what's going on in this region here where the most of the energy comes out. And luckily, we can use emission lines to, um, to help us with that uh, inference. So the standard model of an active nucleus, very briefly, is this. Uh, it has a black hole at the center, ranging in mass, depending on the luminosity of the object and other factors, from about uh, 10 to the 6 for the very tiny ones, up to 10 to the 11, maybe even more, for the really huge ones. I'm talking about ones kind of at the lower end of that mass of black hole spectrum. So moving out from the black hole, we have uh, the accretion disk, which feeds the black hole. Further out from that, we have the broad line region, so-called because the lines are broad and they're dense. And that's what's shown in the middle here. Now, this is a view sideways cut through an AGN. Imagine a sort of saucer on its, or a donut, perhaps, is the usual thing. A donut on its side, and you chop through. And this is what we're seeing here. This donut is often referred to as the dusty molecular torus. It's full of dust, it's full of molecules, and it absorbs radiation. And if you happen to be looking at a particular AGN at this angle, then you won't see directly into the nucleus, and you'll only see the extended emission line region called the narrow line region way out here on scales of about 100 parsecs, whereas the broad line region, we know from variability studies, is on scales of uh, much less than a parsec, uh, a few light weeks maybe light months, much, much smaller. So there's, that's a very brief summary of, uh, of the model. I'm going to be talking mostly about the accretion disk because that's the component that produces most of the photoionization. Uh, and one has to remember, of course, that the accretion disk is spinning because of angular momentum. Um, it has to be conserved. There may also be jets coming out. And these objects, are, if you're looking down the jet, are probably uh, what we call BLX or blazars. But again, my object is a fairly simple AGN, not making life complicated with jets. So it's just the accretion disk. And there will be stars, of course, uh, mixed in with this. And they may have an effect if they get disrupted. I think this is, this is just a little model here. So it turns out that the physics of accretion disks in X-ray binaries and AGN are basically very similar. And this is a model um, of a binary emitting source. So the uh, <coughs> secondary star is feeding uh, material into the accretion disk um, onto the compact object here, the black hole or neutron star, depending, or white dwarf, depending on the mass of it. Um, and of course, it's hotter in the inner regions, viscosity effects and cooler in the outer regions. But there are two major differences, um, probably more than two, but the two that I'm referring to as major are the time scales on which things occur in galactic nuclei. Obviously, you're scaling up by um, orders of uh, hundreds of thousands, um, yeah, about 100,000 up to a million scaling up in the black hole mass. So things are going to happen much more slowly. The disk is much bigger. Uh, and the other big difference is that the um, peak of the distribution of the energy output from these accretion disks will be a function of the black hole mass. Um, and in the case of the, um, of, the of the massive black holes in AGN, that peak will be shifted into the soft X-ray ultraviolet, maybe a little bit into the optical as well, um, whereas in the binaries, it's much higher energies and it's easier to see. So to some extent, uh, it's easier to study the black hole um, physics, the accretion disk physics in binaries than it is in AGN. But that's another story. OK, so I'm introducing now a, I put ish now. I used to call it a new model. But I think at some point, I have to say that it's not that new. It's now getting on for four years old. But it's a newish model by Christine Doan um, in my institute. And some of the key features of this accretion disk model is, strangely enough, you'd think they all did this. But it conserves energy available from the disk. Various components are reprocessed from the accretion disk into other components. And prior to this, there were ad hoc models, which just said, let there be another component in the hard x-rays, let there be a component in the soft x-rays, and there's a disk as well. And what this does is that it conserves energy rather sensibly. Uh, and the, the emission is thermalized to produce black body at large disk radii as you go far out. 
Uh, small radii, the energy is reprocessed. This is the, the point here about, re, about conserving energy into optically thick emission into soft X-ray excess and also another component into an optically thin corona um, which sits above and below the disc. And this gives rise to the uh, X-ray tail. So here's a sort of a half an accretion disc. Obviously, the other half is symmetric over here. Um, and M dot is the accretion rate. M is the mass of the black hole. The red line is what you might call the traditional disc, uh, the Sunyaev uh, disc, whereas the extra components here are to do with the um, coronal component, the corona, and the, uh, the hot, hot soft excess component, shown here rather faintly in the sort of yellowy color. And then this component, this fuzzy component here, is the tail, which is the hard X-ray tail. And that's, that's the model. So before I get to the second part of my talk, which is about Makarian 110, it started off, this, this whole idea, from a sample um, I studied with my student, uh, Chichan Jin, Chinese. Um, he's now working at Max Planck. And we studied a sample of 51 AGN, nothing magic about the number 51, except that we wanted them to be detected in XMM, the X-ray satellite, with more than 500 counts to give us a good spectrum in the X-rays. We wanted them to be low redshift, less than about uh, 0.3, uh, about 0.35, because we wanted H-alpha to be in the SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectrum, so that we could use the H-alpha and the H-beta for various diagnostic purposes. And that's what gave us the 51. And we didn't want them to be reddened either. So that's where we came from. And uh, I won't go through them all, but what we discovered, the principal discovery, I think, of this work was that there is a very large diversity in the spectra of these objects. One size absolutely doesn't fit all. So they're just showing two here. Here is the optical spectrum of one of the objects and another object here. Some have very broad emission lines, H alpha here, oxygen, the famous 5007, H beta, and so on. You can see that this object in F lambda, it's too tiny to read, but this is F lambda against lambda, about um, 3,500 angstroms to 7,000. This object has much broader lines and has a big, strong excess to the blue. And when we do the fitting of the emission lines, we, of course, get very different results for the full width half maximum, which together with the continuum emission around about 5,000 angstroms, these two together, the full width half maximum of the Balmer lines and the continuum, after you've subtracted any component from starlight and after you've subtracted FE2 permitted and various things can be used as a proxy for the black hole mass, which we need for our model. So we did these 51 objects and one of them, oh, before I get there, so we found then that there were three types of SED, basically. There were ones that had big blue bumps, very strong bumps in the unobservable region, but that's what our model at least predicted. And slightly difficult to see here in the greeny yellow were objects of lower Eddington ratio. I'm sure everyone knows what Eddington ratio means. It's the, it's the balance between the radiation pressure pushing out the, uh, the gas trying to accrete and the gravity of the black hole trying to pull the material into the black hole. That's the balance. So super Eddington objects obviously have a lot of radiation pressure. So Eddington ratio of about one, which is highly um, Eddington, have these big bumps. And the low Eddington ratio, the more normal uh, ratio for quasars, 6% approximately, have less bump. And then the ones in the middle have intermediate. We also did some correlation analysis, um, which I probably haven't got time to explain because I'm more or less halfway through already. But what we did briefly is we took the 51 objects and everybody plots everything against everything else. It's the well-known thing in astronomy and you hope that you get lucky uh, <laughs> sometime and then you try to explain it. Yes, carefully not throwing away the points that lie off the, the curve that you, that you want to find. Anyway, this is another way of doing things. What we did here was we take um, an energy spectrum um, from our model, shown along here, this is our model, and we correlate each point of the model energy spectrum against um, oxygen-3, in this particular case, oxygen-3, the strong emission line. And for every one of the 51 objects, we do this, and we get um, a Spearman correlation coefficient 
for those 51 objects. So we do it for this energy, 51 objects get a coefficient. The next energy, 51 objects get a coefficient. So it's a way, really, of looking at the whole picture um, of the whole sample in one go and seeing how the correlation changes um, against this line of oxygen across this big spectrum. Uh, and what we found was, quite interestingly, that in the gray part, which is the unobservable part of the spectrum, it appears that the correlation is particularly not very good. Oh, I should say what these three, these three things are. These are split up in terms of their hard X-ray slope. That's because we believe that's a function of the accretion rate. The hard X-ray slope will tell us about the Eddington ratio. That's why we split them up. So a particular sample here with uh, an index in the, in the hard X-rays of less than 1.8 photon index, for those of you who are into photon indices in X-rays, is very badly correlated with the oxygen. And there are two possibilities, at least two possibilities. One is that our model is no good, and that's why the correlation fails, because our model is uh, doing the wrong thing in the unobservable region, possible. Or it may be that the oxygen lines are not seeing the radiation which is ionizing, um, which is, should be ionizing them from our model. In other words, the model continuum is not being seen by the oxygen. By the way, this line in the middle here is 36 eV, so this is the excitation of uh, oxygen 2 plus, and everything above oxygen 2 plus uh, photons can ionize the gas. So the conclusions from this sample uh, are that there's a big diversity in the SEDs of AGN, and I'm sure that this is not yet fully realized and should be by people who do these big surveys in hard X-rays, you know, with Chandra or XMM, where they only have about three data points, very bad data. And they say, well, yeah, but we know what an SED is, so we'll just make that go through these three data points, and then we've got the answer. Well, that's not the case, because there is a wide diversity of SEDs, so you, you should not assume that one size fits all. It doesn't. And this feeds into the be applying bolometric corrections as well. If you're using a proxy for a bolometric correction, because you don't have the luxury of having the full spectrum, uh, then you can't assume that you've just got a couple of points and that gives you the bolometric correction. And the predictors of the SED are Eddington ratio, black hole mass. These are interrelated. Now, okay, finally, onto the coronal lines uh, and what they can tell us and this modeling. Um, so what they can tell us is something about the winds of the um, winds coming out from the AGN. There are three objects here in optical spectrum, Acarian, these phone numbers you can read yourself. But you can see how different the lines are. Well, you could do if I explain what they are. This is Fe10 here. This is oxygen 1, Fe10 oxygen 1, and this is uh, Fe11. And you see how broad they are in some objects and how very narrow in others and also how very strong they are. Okay, um, so that's, uh, and that's an interesting thing, and it makes them worth studying. Uh, as Gary said, the term coronal lines come from originally from the sun, from studies of the sun where the iron uh, 10 and iron 14 were originally discovered, and this is a time lapse uh, showing the very hot coronal regions of the sun. And so it is possible that uh, regions um, further out from the accretion disk, not actually in the accretion disk, may be producing hard X-rays as are produced here, which then ionize the gas. Uh, uh, let's move on rather quickly because I need to get on to Macari 110. So the coronal line region, it is believed because of the shifts of the lines towards the blue, which is often seen, and the asymmetries of the lines, there's an asymmetry towards the blue end, that they may be in outflow and also they may be in an intermediate region in terms of density between the classic broad line region of a tiny fraction of a parsec and the classic narrow line region much further out. So there could be an interesting intermediate zone between these two. So Makarian 110 in the last few minutes, this is the, the object we studied. Um, why did we choose this object? Well, really because we had good data on it, no particular other reason. Um, it's not reddened very much. So we decided to do it. Obviously, we'd like to do more than one object. It turns out that it's highly variable, the Catalina light curve here. Although it's not a radio source, it's not a BLAC or anything like that, it is highly variable by about a magnitude. Uh, there have been some previous studies uh, by uh, Kalachny, Kalachny um, in uh, 2001, which showed that it's highly variable by a factor of five in the blue. 
So that's something we have to consider when we're doing SEDs. Uh, what he also did, interestingly, was an RMS spectrum, root mean uh, square spectrum, showing that the variable lines are these. This is the root mean square spectrum, which tends to examine, show you where the variability is. So it looks like Fe10 is variable, and also these other lines as well. However, the oxygen 1, of course, and mostly the oxygen 2 are not variable. So the lines are variable. Um, in addition, there is dust variability because this is the K band, K band over here, uh, sampled over several years, and it appears to be a smoothly increasing value, which suggests that the torus may be changing. Uh, we have a William Herschel telescope, 4.2 meter spectrum telescope, which we're in the process of analyzing the spectrum to get the profiles and to study these outflows. Let's finish off then with the actual, oh, not that quick, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> with the, uh, the models, okay, the models using Cloudy. We have a, an observed SED, we have a hot dust component which we have from the infrared observations that we, we have from Hawaii, uh, and the inputs um, to Cloudy, the abundances uh, are necessary, and we, the only free parameter being uh, this one, where we took NH to be about um, 10 to the six particles per cubic centimeter, appropriate for a um, giant molecular cloud in the modeling. So those of you that know about Cloudy were familiar with these sort of outputs. You, you put in your incident SED, shown here. This is our observed SED. Uh, of course, we've used Chris Doan's model to get us into the regions which we cannot observe. And lo and behold, uh, this is the Cloudy output. So the trick is, which I'm coming to, is can we match um, all these coronal lines, which are essentially ionized by these, um, the, this hot component uh, here in the accretion disk, can we actually match all these lines? We have a huge range of them, and the answer is quite well. So it turns out that we think then from the modeling that there are three regions. There's a very hot region, which we call the hot inner torus region. There's a warm atomic region, and there's a cool molecular region. Why do we think this? Well, I'll show you at the end here when we have our little toy model. These are the input spectra. Originally, we used the spectrum from Jin et al. It's a really nice uh, set of data. We have Spitzer, we have near-infrared, we have optical, we have the XMM, we have Swift. We don't really need the radio. We have all these things. Uh, as a refinement, we added these extra points that we didn't have for Jin into our model, and we got a refined SED called SED2. If I can just flip that for a second. Here was the original Jin SED, showing that the peak here was around uh, 1,000 angstroms. You can just about see the peak. But with our refined SED, with all the extra data, our peak is much more shifted towards the optical. And I'm coming to the punchline, almost done. Um, we have dust features at 10 and 20 microns, which are really strong in this object. And that's another thing which uh, Gary's code can help us to model the molecular lines and the dust feature lines. Uh, and it turns out that the best fit of the cloudy model has a covering factor of about 20%, which isn't outrageously different from what people have found when they've done um, large sample studies. Now, you're never going to look at these lines, but all I want you to look at is the bottom line. Each one of these lines, which are not real off, um, is uh, an, emission <coughs> an emission line that we, have that we have measured. There are coronal lines here. There are also hydrogen lines <coughs> as well. This is uh, hydrogen beta. Uh, there's molecular lines as well. There's a whole slew of lines here which we're trying to match. Now, this is SED1, which was the old SED from Jin, which we think we can do better than. Um, and then there's SED2, which we believe is the better line. Uh, and th these lines here, this is the ratio of what we've observed to what the model predicts. Now, you'd think there'd only be two because you've only got two SEDs. The reason there's, um, there's more than two, there's two for each, is because we've dereddened the lines. We all know you need to deredden, and we've done a better job as we can with it by using the partial lines and the hydrogen lines to get an AV and then to deredden them, which seems sensible to do. Of course, we put galactic reddening in naturally. So the bottom line, which literally is the bottom line, if you can see it way down here, is a kind of goodness of fit uh, of the model to our ratio of model to observed. So though you're never going to remember all these lines down here, it's clear the goodness of fit is SED2, that's the refined SED, with the reddening put in. 
And I think it's rather impressive, I would say, that we've managed to get a fit good to within about 30% for nearly all these lines, ranging all the way from neon 5 in the, um, in the blue optical right up to the near-infrared lines, including hydrogen and molecular hydrogen. So this is the last couple of slides. One problem with this is, is that the hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, uh, has to be formed in a region which has an extremely high um, extinction of a thousand, around about a thousand or many hundreds. And there's no way this would be observed uh, at two microns uh, because it would be heavily reddened. So what we, oh, this is just showing the, the cloudy output, showing that the required optical depth then for the hydrogen two, the molecular hydrogen shown here, is what I just said in words, but it's shown in graphical form. It's going to be hundreds of AV up to a thousand to get a high fractional abundance. And what we think is going on is something like we see in the galaxy. These are the pillars of creation, as you know, uh, the famous um, galactic sources where you have ionizing or rather heating and ionizing stars behind here eroding away the, uh, the gas and the, and the molecular material, uh, dissociating it into the interstellar medium. And I think it was Jerry Chris that produced this. If you, if you look at this, what he did was, rather amusingly, he took uh, a little bit of uh, photoshopping from up here and stuck it here. So here's the AGN and <laughs> ionizing the, the sides um, of the molecular torus. So a bit of artistic uh, license here. But this may be what's happening, the hot inner torus here, as just as you have the hot molecular material here, the ionized material. So this is just about the final slide. Uh, this summarizes uh, where we think the um, regions are associated. There's a half million degree very hot dust associated with the inner torus. The hottest dust that you can have is around about 1400 degrees. Silicates can't exist because this is too hot uh, and these, these um, uh, ions are released into the gas phase, but the strong ionized lines are produced in this region, the coronal lines. And this is, as Gary Wells remember, uh, a sketch that was done on my blackboard some years ago, and I'm very much hoping that my trip here is going to reinvigorate this project because uh, a bit like um, a wine, a fine wine, it's been left to mature for a number of years, but I do want to finish it before it turns to vinegar, so uh, this may be an opportunity. So this is our cartoon where we have the very hot region in a torus here in red, uh, and in order to get the very high column that's required, we have to have an angle of viewing such that we can see into this very dense region that we require for the H2, and there needs to be a density gradient uh, decreasing, of course. So in other words, the density decreases in this direction, but we need to have um, a, a particular arrangement where we can see the molecular material through a very high column. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. We have time for a few questions. Oops. I have a very basic question, Martin. They're the worst. <laughs> no. <laughs> So you really did a fine true true with your SEDs, but my question is how, of course, nothing fits one, mm. but how much, you cannot do what you did with quasars, for example, and, well, not yet, mm. and uh, how does this different difference mm -hmm differs yes. uh, with the typical Fairland and Matthews SCD that uh, everybody uses. Actually, us. it's not that far. Actually, Gary might be the right person to answer this. It's not yeah, that far off, but we are looking at very detailed things here yes, in the yes. mission line. So it's even a so small far? change, a small change will, will create a, quite a significant change. Uh -huh. But it's not particularly radically different. Just your other point about we can't do it with quasars, Actually, we are... High red shift. Yeah, well, we can do it with redshift one or two, but not very high. Hmm. We've been trying. If, oh. you, if you look at monthly notices, Collinson, my student, we have started to do it okay. for redshift one. Okay. But I agree you can't do it for high redshift. Okay, thank you. Once upon a time, I kind of worked on the <laughs> was primitive uh, beyond your imagining, if any, 
one ever here has ever looked at any of those old papers from before 1980. They're incomprehensible <laughs> because uh, there was so much that we were trying to simplify at the time, though. But here's an anecdote that kind of ties in with some of the attitudes that Gary was mentioning historically. I remember in 1978, Haggai Netzer and I had found some stupid reason why we thought there might be dust associated with quasars. Now, at the time, a whole lot of people were trying very hard to explain the Lyman-alpha, Lyman-beta ratio by all kinds of radiative transfer mm. methods. And for some personal reason, we disliked that. So at a meeting, I think it was in Santa Cruz, Netzer and I talked about dust associated with AGNs. If you're resourceful, you can probably find the paper I think from I that era. Yeah. And a very prominent California astronomer, a high pangendrum who is certainly not here, uh, said that our idea violated Occam's razor. Because naturally, if people could explain the line ratios by radiative transfer effects, there would no, be no reason to imagine that any dust would ever be present. Um, having said that, I have to comment that your model <laughs> makes Occam's razor a little hard to use. <laughs> Well, that's right. Maybe I can finish with an anecdote as well. I'm debunking a, a modern myth here. When people use the phrase, as I think might have been used or might be used, standing on the shoulders of giants, I don't know whether you know the origin of this, but actually it's a great insult, in fact. It was, uh, it was Isaac Newton talking about his great um, uh, foe called Robert Hooke, who was a very short person, and so he was talking about him standing on the shoulders of giants. So it's not a compliment, it's a great insult, actually. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just one more. So you mentioned briefly that uh, this particular object and other objects are, you know, slightly variable on long time scales. So do you have a feel for just how much that affects your SED model and the total ionizing flux? And do you ultimately attribute that to a change in accretion rate? Yes, very good question. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd have a machine that got you an SED in one go, uh, just as a snapshot. Uh, and that's not ideal. So what we try to do is to link things up. I mean, this, this Catalina survey is really very nice in a way because at least you know whether the thing is in a high state or a low state uh, when you come to do your matching observations. So, yeah, we try to match them as close as we can, but it's never going to be better than maybe 20% or so in between the different uh, bands. And it will have an effect on, uh, on the outputs, absolutely true. Um, I think for, the, for these CFETs, which are not radio loud, and don't have jets. The problem is not quite severe, so severe. But as we all know, if you're looking at blazars, they can do something in a, in a day. So we wouldn't even attempt to, that, to do that. But it's something we're always concerned about. So we thank the speaker again. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, I'm calling Luigi, Luigi Spinoglio. We'll talk of fire infrared spectra of active galaxies and cloudy models. At 11, I'm going to show you 10 minutes at 11. It's okay? Uh, you have... Yeah. I have uh, 25. You have 30 minutes here. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So at... You show me five minutes beforehand? Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning to everybody. I'm talking uh, uh, about uh, far in infrared, far infrared spectroscopy, much longer wavelengths that, uh, than we did before, than uh, was presented before. Because, of course, uh, when you have dust, the emission is going to be blocked by the dust. 
and if we go to longer wavelengths, we might see what is happening. So my talk will be about the uh, far infrared spectra uh, of active galaxies, but also star formation and cloudy modeling of, of these regions. Uh, and this will be exploited with, with a new mission that is going to be uh, hopefully uh, launched uh, uh, more than 10 years from now. Uh, it's going to be an M5, a NISA plus JAXA mission, which is in competition now. And we hope to, 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 to get with this uh, SPICA mission. This is the picture of it. OK, so basically, uh, this is my summary. I will show Herschel Pax, uh, the, the, the spacecraft Herschel, a three and a half meter infrared telescope, uh, uh, which uh, was doing spectroscopy. Uh, uh, what we did, we collected all the, the AGN observed uh, into the archive of Herschel Pax, uh, wavelength from about 50 to 200 micron, uh, of about 170 active galaxies, and we compared to, with 20 starburst galaxies uh, and 43 dwarf galaxies from uh, Herschel Dwarf Galaxy Surveys uh, by Susan Madden et al. We compare this data with cloud photonization models uh, to, to have uh, the best diagnostic gram diagrams that, that we can. And we found out that uh, the oxygen 3 to oxygen 4 versus neon 3 over neon 2, for instance, uh, is a very nice diagram because it can separate the various emission regions from both AGN, starburst galaxies, and dwarf galaxies. Because dwarf galaxies have, uh, are dominated by star formation, but having low metallicity, their spectra are completely different from normal starburst galaxies. Uh, we will also show that uh, using a combination of neon and sulfur lines, uh, we can measure metallicities pretty well in dust-obscured objects. So uh, why infrared? Because it will avoid most of the extinction. It, it will cover the ionization density space. In this diagram, we can see how the critical density of these lines move uh, as a function of ionization potential. So at low energies, we can map photodissociation regions. Uh, we, we also have oxygen one, which is a neutral line, of course, is off the diagram. Then we have a bunch of uh, stellar H2 region lines uh, up to uh, uh, about uh, 50 electron volts. Then we have AGNs above 50 electron volts and above their corona lines that Martin Ward was talking about. These lines can trace both star formation and black hole accretion. OK, uh, why? The, the main scope, uh, or, or, and one of the big uh, uh, new things that uh, SPICA, the new satellite, will be able to do is to trace uh, both black hole accretion and the star formation along cosmic times uh, uh, at about redshift 4. Uh, the, on the left, we can see the difference between infrared measurements, the, the, the red points, and uh, ultraviolet uh, optical observations. There is a factor 10 from about redshift 0 up to redshift uh, of 3. So what the HST, or, and maybe in the future JWST, will map will be only 10% maybe of the whole energy of the universe in these cosmic times. Moreover, AGN accretion is doing the same. Uh, it, first of all, also AGN accretion is obscured. And then the, the shape of the AGN accretion history is very similar to the star formation rate history. Of course, the numbers are different. There is a factor of 3,000 between the two functions. But the shape is the same. And the fact that the shape is the same means uh, that we can understand the origin of the Magorian relation pretty well, because these two phenomena are connected. The black hole inside is connected to the, to the bulge of the stars. And in fact, we see in the local universe this beautiful relation between, uh, between black hole mass and mass of the bulge of stars or velocity dispersion and so on. It may be that even above redshift 3, we have dust. We have so much dust that the, 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 the star formation function is going to be flat, almost flat up to maybe redshift 6. We do not know. For this reason, we need a new satellite. 
Okay, what was done before? ISO had a very nice result, the SWS on the left, you can see that the oxygen 4 to neon 2 infrared lines, or maybe oxygen 4 to sulfur 3, versus the strength of the PAH, polyaromatic hydrocarbon features, can measure the relative contribution of AGNs versus star formation. On the right, there are some results from, from Spitzer. We can see that neon 2, neon 5 over neon 2, as well as uh, oxygen 4 to neon 2, can measure versus, again, the equivalent width of the PAH on the top, on the center diagram, can measure how much AGN is in a galaxy and how much star formation. Because in the local universe, we experience that star formation and AGN accretion are going on together in most systems. Again, another diagram showing oxygen 4 to neon 2 versus neon 5 to neon 2, same, same information. The spectra have different slopes. The, the black one, the steep one, is a starburst galaxy. The red one is in an AGN1. There is an old sequence with different spectral indexes because the AGN is showing up in the CIFAT ones, in the, in the, in the real AGN. Okay, what Herschel did uh, adding to, to the story, we can find good ratio like oxygen 3 to oxygen 4 to separate uh, starbursts uh, and AGMs. On the left, uh, the blue grids are cloudy AGM models. On the right, uh, cloudy plus starburst 99 input spectra of, of uh, uh, a continuum starburst with age 20 uh, million years. You can see that there is a factor 100 between uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, this line ratio. Uh, on the right, we can see that uh, uh, carbon-2 over nitrogen-2 can disentangle the contribution from PDR emission from A2 regions. So we, you can see in this right diagram two grids. The black grid at the right is made with a, a starburst continuum plus PDR, we, we are simulating a PDR, uh, uh, leaving the integration going down to 50K. So uh, cloudy can mimic uh, the, the photodissociation region, just going to low temperature to an extended region. O on the, the other grid, uh, in dotted grid on the left is just a starburst emission with integration stops at 1000K. You can see that most observations are saying that most carbon-2 emission is coming from a PDR. So uh, using these lines, carbon-2 to nitrogen-2, we can measure exactly how much PDR emission there is in a region. Okay, what we did is we take all agents in the Veron CT and Veron 2010 catalog uh, with, uh, with available Pax Herschel and IRS Spitzer spectroscopy to cover the full range from 10 to 200 micron. These are the lines that, that we worked. In total, we have 170 AGN divided in 54 CIFAT1, 26 hidden CIFAT1s that can see, we, we can see broad lines in polarimetric measurements, 57 CIFAT2 and 33 liners. We compared this with the study of Cormier of dwarf galaxies, and we selected also 20 starburst galaxies from, from these papers. Okay. The details of the models, we use uh, Cloudy 13.03, Pi Cloudy Library. Uh, AGN narrow line region models have constant density, plant parallel geometry, hydrogen density 10 to the 1, 10 to the 6. AGN continua power low with slope minus 1.4. Ionization potential from uh, 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3.5. And, and the models were stopped at the column density and age 10 to the 23. Liner galaxies, same story, but with another slope. Alpha is now minus 3.5 because at very low Eddington, this, this is what Martin said before, at very low Eddington ratios, these galaxies, the, the accretion this disappears, and the power low that best mimic is a, a much steeper power low, 3.5. Star formation ionizing spectrum is Starburst 99, lighter than 99. Uh, we used uh, a young burst of star formation, one million year, with a low metallicity, one-fifth of solar, to mimic the dwarf galaxies. And we used a continuum burst of star formation for the regular starburst galaxies. Planned parallel geometry again, constant pressure now, initial densities 
10 to the 1, 10 to the 6, ionization 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4.5. Uh, we also tried an instant star formation model, but there is basic no, no big differences. The problem we will see is oxygen 4 to oxygen 3. Okay, here, on the left, uh, we have carbon 2 over oxygen 1, which uh, are, are telling us uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, about density uh, versus uh, neon 3 to neon 2, which is telling us about ionization in that particular range, not just ionization. Ionization in the 41 to 22, in the 22 to 20, to 41 electron volt range. We can see that dwarf galaxies have an higher ionization compared to AGNs there, and starbursts are in the place where we expect them. If we use instead oxygen 3 to oxygen 4, now dwarf galaxies are somewhat in between starburst and AGNs. Uh, but the point here is, uh, it is clear that the oxygen 3 to oxygen 4 line ratio cannot, for, for both starburst galaxies and dwarf galaxies, cannot be reproduced by cloudy models, not because cloudy is not working, but because the input of cloudy is not correct. The stellar atmospheres, the stellar atmosphere models do not, do not reproduce the data. There is a factor 100 between, I, I will show this better uh, later. Okay, this is again the, the, the point about this entangling uh, uh, PDR emission from uh, H2 region emission, starburst emission from PDR. Of course, these two are going together because when you have an H2 region, then if you have molecular material in the region between the H2 region and the molecular material, you will have a PDR. And these lines are pretty bright in, in, in all local galaxies, carbon-2, oxygen-1, and so on. So again, there is nothing new. We reproduce the results of last year. Basically, with a larger sample, we can say that most of the emission in the local AGNs, which do have star formation uh, together with the AGN, is, we, we do not have pure AGN. I mean, there are very few of them. May, maybe the blazar that was mentioning uh, uh, um, uh, before Martin are uh, a pure AGN. Anyway, uh, th this is uh, just to show what is the best uh, line ratio to separate uh, AGN from starburst galaxies. On the left, we take the classical oxygen 4 to neon 2. It's not working very well when you put uh, the uh, dwarf galaxies. You can see the, the violet points up there. Uh, we can see this is a this line ratio, oxygen 4 to neon 2 versus luminosity in oxygen 4. So the more AGN, the more objects you go to the right, but uh, the oxygen 4 to neon 2 should be a good indicator of AGN uh, percent. It is not when you have uh, this kind of uh, dwarf galaxies. We also tried neon 2 plus neon 3, Oxygen 4 over neon 2 plus neon 2, again, versus uh, oxygen 4 luminosity. And the thing is better, but the spread is pretty high. Okay, finally, we found out that oxygen 4 to oxygen 3 is the best uh, indicator for AGN percent in a galaxy because it shows this pretty nice uh, shape and uh, the dwarf galaxies are now sitting in the position of star or starburst dominated galaxies at low oxygen 4 luminosity and low oxygen 4 to oxygen 3 ratio if we compare with uh, uh, again oxygen 4 to oxygen 3 versus uh, the uh, flux ratio uh, of 2 to 10k x rays to far infrared flux ratio we have again uh, this nice uh, shape of increasing the, the X-ray flux uh, to infrared uh, with uh, this uh, line ratio. Okay, so what, what, what we define now, this is the new BTP diagram from infrared observations. We can see that uh, this diagram, neon 3 over neon 2 versus oxygen 4 to oxygen 3, can separate pretty well all emission line galaxies. We have AGN sitting there, liners, in between uh, uh, starbursts uh, 
and agents, and we have low metallicity dwarf galaxies. The point here, as I was saying before, is that models, we, we have this nice grid of models, the, the blue one is reproducing uh, quite uh, well the agents, the green one at uh, quite high uh, uh, densities can reproduce uh, the liners, but uh, the starburst models are off uh, by factor 10 from the models, the observations are, you know, have uh, an oxygen 4 to oxygen 3 line ratio which is 100 times more than what is predicted. And for the dwarf galaxy, a similar thing happened because uh, uh, we, we should have densities of 10 to the 6, but this is not, is not very realistic in the whole galaxy to have an average density of 10 to the 6. We would expect 10 to the 3, 10 to the 2. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, we can mimic with the infrared lines, we can measure. Uh, okay, we know that this region of the spectrum cannot be observed, as Martin was saying before, but we can use the infrared lines because they happen to have these energies, these production energies. So we can, and the problem of oxygen three and oxygen four is exactly, is exactly there. The starburst models are going down pretty, pretty much also, the, the dwarf models are going down, but the oxygen four to oxygen three ratio is not reproduced, so what is lacking? We need something more. We need some more energy there. We need maybe world for AS stars, we need strong winds, we need uh, uh, shocks maybe. Uh, we need the theoretician to do some work at this point because, because uh, we are missing a lot. We, we are missing a factor 100 in the oxygen three to oxygen four line ratio. So this is another BTP diagram that you can choose, sulfur four over sulfur three over oxygen four to oxygen three. Same story. The, another point that I want to make, uh, this, a combination of these line ratios, neon uh, three plus neon two, most of, most all of the neon over sulfur four to sulfur three, can this line ratio, uh, this composite line ratio, can reproduce pretty well the metallicity in dusty objects. Uh, here, because our objects are not so dusty, we are in the local universe, uh, and these are optically visible objects, uh, uh, we have put dwarf galaxies and starburst galaxies. Dwarf galaxies have low metallicity, starburst galaxies a kind of solar metallicities, and this is an interesting line ratio to be used. What is next? Speaker is next. We know the tools, rest frame, 10 to 100 micron, but we need a new space telescope to do the job. JWST will not cover the redshift one to four range because it's, it finishes at 28 micron. So it will do the boring job with optical and ultraviolet lines, which we know are dust extinted. So if, we, if you want to trace uh, the mid-infrared rest frame, you need to go to longer wavelengths. ALMA will do it, but at, at redshift more than four, at uh, more than 70 micron lines from oxygen three above. So speaker, which is working from 10 to 200 mi 30 micron, can do the job. What we want to do, uh, the year is here. Uh, in 87, found uh, this beautiful BTP diagram and start filling up maybe 100 galaxies. Groves, uh, uh, 20 years later, 10 to the five galaxies with Sloan. What we want to do is to do this diagram for dusty objects uh, in 2028, up to relative maybe four with Spica. These are the main astrophysical questions. What processes start, regulate, eventually stop star formation in the universe? What are the relative contribution of nuclear fusion stars, gravitational potential, accretion, accreting black holes, to photon production after reionization? What is the origin and composition of the first dust in the universe? And when did this arise? And Spica will uniquely perform observations that will study the physical condition in dust obscured objects uh, before and after the star formation peak at Recif 2, uh, trace star formation and black hole accretion on, in, in large sample of uh, main sequence, uh, normal, normal luminosity galaxies up to Recif 3 to 4, 
and study the interactions between star formation and black hole accretion. That is the one that uh, probably uh, produced the Magorian relation. And then detect the dust during the epoch of ionization, chart the production of heavy elements, organic molecules in the ISM of galaxies as a function of cosmic time. We have, we have, we, we don't have yet, but we will have, hopefully, a new 2.5 meter telescope cooled at 8 Kelvin with new instruments. Safari will be a 35 to 230 micron grating, low, low 300 resolution, but with a very high sensitivity of 5 and 10 to minus 20 watt per meter square. We will have an high resolution Martin Papler channel with a resolution 2000. 10,000, same spectral range. We will have a far infrared imager and polar emitter working from 100 to 300 micron. And uh, short wavelength uh, instruments, a, a grating with 1,000 resolution, a low resolution, like Spitzer IRS low resolution, 5,100, uh, large field, 12 to 10 plus imager. This is very powerful for surveying. And we will have an high resolution spectroscope, uh, spectrometer from the 12 to 18 micron at uh, 25,000. 25, this is the new project, an ESA plus JAXA instrument, two and a half cooled at eight K, uh, less than 8K, maybe 6K. This is the gain, this is the gain uh, compared to Herschel or JWST. We will have a reduction of the noise by a factor one million. Okay, this is amazing. People do not think, but uh, using JWST is like working with a telescope dome on fire in this wavelength range. So this is, will be the gain in sensitivity that we will have compared to Herschel factor 10, sorry, factor 100 between Herschel, Spire, and Parks to speak a safari uh, even more, maybe, at uh, 300 or 3,000 uh, spectral resolution. So JWST will be worse than uh, SPICA at wavelength above uh, something like uh, 20, 20 micron, in, in the last range, 20 to 28 micron. So these are my conclusions. After many, many years of efforts, we think we are close to have reliable infrared measurements of star formation rate and accretion rate uh, using infrared, far infrared, uh, rest frame uh, uh, spectroscopic surveys, completely unaffected, most, mostly, com most, uh, mostly unaffected by, by dust, allowing us to study the evolution of galaxies in terms of stellar fusion and gravity powers. Uh, we know that these are the major energy production processes in the universe, in galaxies, are star formation and black hole accretion. If we can measure the energy from both these systems, we can understand galaxy evolution. Uh, we, we learn how to do this in the local universe using mid and far infrared spectroscopy. Uh, oxygen 4 to, to oxygen 3 line ratio together with neon 3 to neon 2 or sulfur-4 to sulfur-3 is the best to disentangle any kind of star formation from AGN accretion, the, what we call the new infrared BTP diagram. And uh, the, pro the point is uh, we need to update current photonization models to account for the new oxygen-4 to oxygen-3 problem. Stellar synthesis models do not predict uh, this uh, observed ratio. Uh, far infrared spectroscopic service with SPICA will, be, will, will do galaxy evolution in a physical way, through lines, not through. Because, okay, these things have been measured by the photometers, Herschel photometers, special photometers, but are we sure of what the process is? They take templates, they take models. This is all model dependent. They do not know that the templates used here can work at redshift 4. They do not know if uh, the local objects are representative of the objects above redshift 3, so spectroscopy is needed. And, uh, okay, we, we have an instrument. We have an instrument, hopefully, 
uh, to be launched in 2028 with a pretty high sensitivity and we will be able to look at thousands of, of galaxies and deciding how the universe uh, uh, made galaxy evolution in the last uh, few billion years. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Questions? Yes, I'm sure it was on one of the view graphs, but I must have missed it. The sensitivity looks really fantastic. In terms of spectral resolution, will you be able to um, get good enough resolution to do outflows uh, on these Yes, objects? okay. I, I will show you the, the um, characteristics oh. of the two instruments. This is, uh, this is the, the long wavelength instrument, Safari. You, you can have... Uh, uh, 3,000, a high resolution means that we have this resolution depending on wavelengths. This is a Martin Puppet. So we can have at 35 micron, more than 10,000, down to almost 2,200. Uh, well, we stop at 230, so it's about here. So we can observe outflows. Uh, uh, we can observe outflows uh, uh, up to redshift uh, one to one and a half, depending on the resolution. So. The big problem, uh, I put it interactions uh, in one of my slides, one of the speaker goals would be to track the interactions between black hole and galaxy, and so to measure outflows and infalls. We are working with a proposal, it's going to be submitted in a, few, in a couple of months, so we, we are uh, assessing this, exactly this point, because it's very important to understand if uh, outflows have a major impact in galaxy evolution. And, and because after observation of Markarian 231 and all the other, uh, maybe the year we'll talk about this, uh, all the other Eulerks uh, by Herschel, we realize that this, uh, we have the mean, we have oxygen four, uh, sorry, uh, we have OH lines, maybe also oxygen one for, for infall, but o OH lines are the best to trace uh, infalling and outflowing material, uh, uh, and we will get to redshift one to one, one and a half at luminosities less than 10 to the 12. So, um, of course, we, because... Uh, Miri will stop at 28 microns, so they will not have any OH lines. They will observe H2. Yes. Yeah, they will observe H2. But the point is that Miri will quit at a very short wave, uh, at a very short redshift, about one. Okay, do you have another question there? Uh, so I would guess the answer is no, but do any of your new line ratios, did you see any significant separation between Seifert 1s and Seifert 2s in terms of? Well, in principle, the, the Spitzer lines will, will do the job because uh, um, let me see, in the original work that we did with Spitzer uh, here, uh, okay, AGN2, pure AGN2 are, uh, they, they cover everything, but most of the objects, most, most of the type ones uh, have an higher neon 5 to neon 2 ratio, while uh, the Cifer 2 are spread around, so one should go each object and see what is happening. But yes, in principle, we can. Uh, the violet points are hidden Cifer ones. We already made the, the difference between, uh, because these objects are the same. It's just the point we are observing them from another angle, but polarization is, is making a mirror for us, so. Do you have a question? Last question. Uh, so just a quick general comment. Um, so I don't work on anything to do with AGN, but um, these disks, I think it's quite likely that the accretion disks are going to be gravitationally unstable. Um, I was wondering if generally as a community that the observational Im impact of that has been studied at all in terms of the, um, I mean, it's going to affect what you're seeing because you can have uh, lower density regions and higher density regions than you uh, otherwise currently expect, I guess. Uh, I think that observations of accretion disk uh, can, can in principle be done by looking at the shape of the ionizing spectrum. What I mean, uh, okay, here is a, is, is a quite uh, 
uh, uh, rough approximation AGNs uh, are here, liners are here. In reality, we can do better modeling, putting the accretion disks. And what we can see is that liners uh, that, uh, where the accretion disks disappear, they do have different line ratios. So uh, an important thing is that infrared lines uh, can map, okay, also some optical lines, but here you, you have a problem of extinction. Uh, if you want to map the ionizing spectrum, you can use directly a number of these infrared lines, and, and you can see there is a work by Alexander et al., 1999, on the spectrum of NGC 4151. Uh, she was working with uh, ISO data, SWS and LWS spectroscopy data, and she was, for the first time, telling this story, you use the infrared lines to map the, 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 pri the, the primary continuum, the ionizing continuum. So it would be nice to, uh, for instance, yes, accretion disk might be unstable. It would be nice to, to monitor these lines, uh, at least in local objects, uh, for, for, a, for, for a long time to see what is happening in the ionizing spectrum of these galaxies. Okay. Uh. Yeah, well, we will start in uh, 12 years from now, but then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's thank Luigi again. And we have finished the first part of this meeting. Now it's time for poster viewing and coffees. Um, please be back at 12. Over here. Ti è piaciuto? Sì, Tu devi scappare. Tu devi scappare adesso. Ah, fra poco. Ah, ok. Dopo il ok. Vogliamo stare in contatto. Ma certo, ti piace questo lavoro? Eh? Interessante, no? Vediamo che più che altra roba possiamo fare. Certo, io ho bisogno, se, se questa missione va avanti. Io ho bisogno di, di un good science team e io ti invito. Io, io, sono, io sono il piccolo, ca, piccolo capo, piccolo del, capo. Piccolo capo del, del uh, Galaxy Evolution Science Team. E allora litigo sempre con gli olandesi perché <ride> metto questo qua. That works. Okay, I didn't expect that. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Don't go, we didn't do it. Alright, thank you very much. Now I know. <laughs> okay. Are you going to make a web page with the frogs from liners? Yeah, well. Coconuts will be good. But only a PDF file, okay. not a paper. But the, the presentations or, or whatever you want. Ah. I, I can send you the PDF. Or it can be a PDF, it can be a paper if you want to write a paper. Okay. okay. It will appear on ABS. Okay. Yeah, right. The number yeah. of people that send them. Okay. Yeah. So it's, there will not be a particular website of the conference, but uh, everything will go on as so we are. Yeah. There will be there will be a
Okay, testing one, two, three, four, five. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, I hear talking in the back, but I, I don't know if you're talking to me. Hi, Fred, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. And so if I do this. Okay, I start Maximo. Okay, so and I can, yeah, and I can present uh, your PDF. Okay. Okay. Your audio is still great, but I think there is a bad. Wow, está muy. No está muy bueno el, el sonido. No, no le escucho bien. Uh, sorry, I, I have to speak English with you. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I don't hear you very well. Hi, right, speak again. No, this is the, 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 the bandwidth. Where is the Skype? No, it's just... Okay, I am connected with the Wi-Fi here. I will try to find some adapter to, to connect the Mac to the uh, inter, uh, Ethernet. I will come back in um, uh, five minutes, okay? Okay, thank you.
esta ocasión, la Orquesta Filarmónica de la UNAM, bajo la dirección del maestro Jan Latham Koenig, director artístico, interpreta Sinfonía número 9 en Re menor, opus 125, coral, de Ludwig van Beethoven. Engalanan este concierto las voces de Anabel de la Mora, soprano. Encarnación Vázquez, mezzo soprano. Ernesto Ramírez, tenor. Y Jesús Suaste, barítono. Bueno, es una experiencia casi religiosa. Es, 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 eh, es una obra que está sobre todas las obras de la civilización occidental. Es una obra clave y fundamental. about cloudy applications to red quasars and quasar outflows. Do you think everyone can hear me okay? Perfect. Yes. Yes.
Okay, thank you very much. I can see actually the, my my presentation on YouTube. Yeah.
Yes, I'm here. Okay, very good. Yes, the case. Okay. Please, please take your seats. Okay. Now we have this last part of the morning session. It's a talk by Fred Hammond that unfortunately couldn't make to come, but he sent his talk and are going to talk us by Skype, I think. Okay, Skype is very modern, <laughs> using all the possibilities. And Christoph is helping us with going with the slides. So any moment you want, is Cloudy Applications to Red Quasars and Quasars Outflows by Fred Hammond helped by Christophe Morisset. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me know if uh, there's a problem hearing me. Um, my apologies for not making it there. I wish I had a good, good excuse, but I don't. You probably heard the story, I won't tell you. Um, so I had a hard time choosing what to talk about, so I'm going to talk about two projects um, that have uh, essential cloudy applications. Um, so next slide, please. Slide two. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> um, okay, so the Red Quasar project um, one slide of introduction to that. Um, the idea is that um, we want to test the role of quasars in galaxy evolution. And across the top there, you can see a common scenario for how quasars fit into a massive galaxy formation, where the idea is a major merger, a huge starburst that's a ULARG or a submillimeter galaxy. Okay, patience, patience. Are you there? <laughs> start again, start again, yes. The, uh, uh, <laughs> Cuelga y vuelve a hablar porque no se oye nada. <laughs> I trust. <laughs> By Nick Ross. Uh, we. Sorry. Oh. Yes, I'm still here. Um, all right, so just real quick, are you, you have me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Don't trust Carlos Slim. <laughs> ¿Es eso? Is on the YouTube screen. Are, are we still okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, we found at high redshift, though, there's a subset of these objects that have very peculiar properties. And some of their spectra are shown on the right hand side of this slide number three. Uh, the top three panels are these extremely red quasars that I'm going to call ERQs. The bottom panel is a Sloan composite from Vandenberg 2001. And what you see in the Sloan composite is just a normal quasar spectrum with the equivalent width of the carbon-4 emission line that um, <clears throat> uh, is only 24 angstroms. But in the ERQs, the equivalent width of that line is several hundred. In the ERQ plots in, the, in, the, uh, in those spectra, the red line there is the Sloan composite spectrum. So you can see what a normal quasar spectrum would look like right compared to the ERQs. And the ERQs are extremely different. One of the things you notice is that nitrogen-5 is extremely strong, and it's even stronger in some cases than Lyman-alpha. <clears throat> so what we did lately uh, to follow on to that is measure all the carbon-4 and nitrogen-5 lines in the BOSS survey, look at this high redshift sample, and then try to understand how these unusual ERQs kind of fit into the whole quasar population. So next slide, please, slide number four. Um, <clears throat> there are many plots like this. Um, <clears throat> the right-hand panel shows the strength of the carbon-4 emission line, the equivalent width, and a, against a measure of the kurtosis index, which is a measure of the profile shape. And, and so on the left side of that plot, you see the low values of the kurtosis correspond to strong wings and uh, sort of normal looking profiles, but on the far right are these very boxy wingless profiles. And the ERQs stand out for having these boxy wingless profiles plus very strong breast equivalent widths. And the red colored dots in that, um, in that figure show the extremely red quasars. So when you look at the quasars in that figure that are extremely red, they cluster in the upper right with very strong equivalent widths and these unusual shape profiles. And in the right-hand panel, it's the carbon-4 strength against the nitrogen-5 to carbon-4 line flux ratio. And again, you see that the um, ERQs cluster in that uh, green dashed oval, um, <clears throat> very different than normal quasars. They are not an extension of some trend across the quasar population. They have a very unique, peculiar set of line properties. Um, and they're strongly correlated with their red I minus W3 color. Um, okay, next slide. Um, this shows uh, a median spectra of the ERQs, that's the black spectrum, um, compared to some other blue quasar samples. And I'll just draw your attention to the one shown in green. The green spectrum is blue quasars that are matched in W3 magnitude. W3 magnitude should be not affected by extinction. 
So this is our surrogate for luminosity. So this is a luminosity matched blue quasar sample. And you can see how the green spectrum is very, very different than the ERQs in the line strengths, the line profiles, and the line ratios. And, so, and it's strongly related to this basically rest frame UV to mid-infrared color. Okay, next slide. And usually large uh, nitrogen-5 emission lines is something that Gary Ferland and I talked about a long time ago, and I, I don't want to uh, spend much time on that, but I'm going to just show you this one slide from uh, the annual review article we wrote. And across the top is a figure that Gary created for that paper um, that shows on the right-hand side nitrogen-5 to carbon-4, and the fact that it's actually very difficult to have very strong nitrogen-5 emission lines. These are a series of calculations done with solar abundances. And we found that you needed to selectively enhance the nitrogen abundance, and that's correlated with an overall enhancement in metallicity to get the line strengths we see. A particular problem for the ERQ is if you look at the left-hand panel in that figure, is that in the part of this parameter space where nitrogen-5 to carbon-4 is strong, the equivalent width in, in carbon-4 is low. So these ERQs have very large equivalent widths and very large nitrogen-5 carbon-4 ratios, and that's something we're still going to explore. Okay, next slide. Um, this slide is just, so this is uh, slide number seven. This is to show you that we have many of these. There are several hundred in the BOSS Quasar catalog. They're luminous. The, the median luminosity is around 10 to the 47 in the redshift range shown there. Uh, it's a very it's surprisingly homogeneous sample with these peculiar properties selected just by color out of the BOSS Quasar catalog. Um, an additional property I haven't mentioned yet is that outflows seem to be very characteristic of this whole population and might be the driving phenomenon behind everything that we see. If you look at these spectra, the carbon-4 emission line is the one in the middle of the plot. And on the blue side of carbon-4, many of them have a little dip. That's a bell or bell-like outflow feature. Um, if you go to the next slide, slide eight. This shows um, on the right side spectra where we're just blowing up. You can see the continuum better and the bell-like features in carbon-4 and silicon-4. They're extremely common across the sample much more common, several times more common than in normal BOSS quasars. So that's a one a common characteristic of the ERQs are these bells. Next slide, slide nine. Um, <clears throat> other evidence we find for outflow, which is just remarkable, is um, large blue shifts in the carbon-4 emission line. One of the problems is trying to figure out where zero velocity is. But in some cases, there is a narrow Lyman alpha spike, which we attribute to a large Lyman alpha halo around the host galaxies. And that must be moving at low velocities, we'll call it velocity zero. And then the red lines in that figure show the expected positions of nitrogen five and carbon four relative to that, the rest frame of that narrow Lyman alpha spike. And you can see that carbon-4 is extremely blue shifted, several thousand kilometers per second. In the bottom plot, the, the velocity shift of carbon-4 is almost 8,100 kilometers per second. And in fact, if you look at where nitrogen-5 is, it's on the wrong side of Lyman alpha. The shift is so large. Now, compared to other quasars in Sloan, in the lower left panel there, you see a figure by Gordon Richards um, that shows carbon-4 equivalent width versus carbon-4 blue shift. And our objects would be in the upper right of that figure with large blue shifts and large equivalent widths. In fact, they would even be off scale with their blue shifts so large. And there's nothing up in Gordon's plot. Uh, so it's, a, it's another very unusual characteristic of these, this sample. <clears throat> Next slide, slide 10. Um, the third thing related to outflows is we wanted to see what the forbidden lines were doing. So these objects are redshifts two to three. We need to go out into the infrared. We got extruder spectra to look at the O3 emission line. 
And this plot, this figure just shows the sample. On the left side, you see blue quasars that we selected to have carbon-4 equivalent lists that match the ERQ. So these are rare blue quasars that happen to still have large carbon-4 equivalent lists. On the, on the right side are the ERQs. And you can see the differences in the line profiles especially. Um, but we're at least controlling for the carbon-4 line strength. Um, so now let's see what they look like in the infrared. Next slide, slide 11. On the left side of that, you see the blue quasars, where there's again the profile of carbon-4, and then next to that, a normal-looking H-beta and oxygen-3 pair, where the full width at half maximum of the oxygen-3 is less than 1,000 kilometers per second. It's what you expect from narrow land regions, the normal quasars. But then look at the right side with the ERQs. The oxygen-3 is so broad and, and with a blue tail that the oxygen-3 lines are blended together and it overwhelms the H-beta. The full width of half max in O3 is as broad as 5,000 kilometers per second, which is completely unprecedented. And this is a forbidden line, so it can't form down in the broad line region really near, uh, near the quasar. It must form in a more extended environment. We don't have imaging data. We're going to try to get IFU data. We don't have that yet. Um, but just from the photoionization analysis, it's got to be at some significant distance, at least about a kiloparsec away from the black hole in a very high-speed outflow. So these are very good candidates, a large-scale high-speed outflow. These are good candidates for disrupting the galaxy and causing feedbacks and, and potentially a blowout in evolution schemes. Okay, so next slide, slide 12, a real quick summary of the results for this red quasar population. They're luminous, they're at redshifts two to three. They have a particular set of unusual emission and absorption line properties that I think is related to outflows. It's strongly correlated with red color. And in the middle of that summary in white there, you see it, th these peculiar properties are not consistent with normal quasars behind a dust reddening screen. So they're not just red quasars, they're red quasars with something else going on that we think is powerful outflows, possibly because of high accretion rates, possibly because of very high metallicities, which would enhance the outflows. And now the, what we're trying to understand is whether this has anything to do with galaxy evolution. So we're getting HST images of the host. We're applying for ALMA time to look at the CO and check for blowouts of the ISM and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's that project. And the reason I bring it up is because the cloudy analysis is going to be central to understanding what's going on. And now I'm going to tell you very quickly about another project, if you go to slide 13, having to do with quasar outflows. <clears throat> um, so here, just the general question with quasar outflows is, to again, to address the evolution scheme um, paradigm do quasar outflows have enough energy to power feedback? So what are their mass loss rates? What are their kinetic energy yields? Does it depend on luminosity? Does it depend, depend on accretion rate, et cetera? One of the biggest problems in studying these broad absorption line outflows is that they are usually very optically thick, even though the lines do not reach zero intensity. And that's because the absorbing material does not completely cover the background light source. And in the lower right there, you see a schematic of what we think is going on. You've got quasar light passing through a patchy medium, and some of the quasar light goes through there unabsorbed and fills in the bottoms of the troughs. <clears throat> so it makes a detailed analysis very complicated when you can't trust the strengths of the lines to tell you what the column densities are. So we've developed some schemes to get around that, and one of them is low abundance ions like phosphorus-5. In the spectrum there in the upper right, you can see phosphorus-5 at about 1120 angstroms. Phosphorus is about 800 times less abundant than carbon in the sun, and it has very similar ionization characteristics to uh, carbon-4. So when we see the phosphorus-5, we know carbon-4 is extremely optically thick. So carbon-4 is not useful to us, but phosphorus-5 gives us very good constraints on the true optical depths and column densities and kinetic energies. 
And I also just want to mention, not shown in the spectrum there, Karen Laley has done some interesting work on excited state absorption lines in helium-1, which provide similar constraints on the column densities. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just to show you part of the importance of cloudy and all of the um, this absorption line analysis. I know the emphasis of this meeting was emission lines and how people apply cloudy to that, but it's been incredibly important for understanding outflows and absorption lines. And the plot shown here is a beautiful plot created by Karen Laley a few uh, years ago, showing predicted uh, optical depths in different lines using cloudy. Um, and you can see in the bottom left panel, so for different parameters of column density and ionization parameter, it's very hard to get optical depths in phosphorus 5 above unity unless the column densities are huge. And across the top, you see these excited state helium-1 lines giving you similar constraints. The column densities need to be extremely large if you see these uh, particular lines. Okay, next slide. So now I just want to show you what we've done lately related to this. Um, in, a, in the Quest survey led by Sylvain Veyu, um, he gets UV uh, HST spectra of many quasars, and one of them is shown here that has an outflow system with many of these very interesting absorption lines that are, provide valuable diagnostics on the physical conditions. And you can see nitrogen-5 and Lyman alpha there. There's various excited state lines. In the lower panel, you can see phosphorus-5, et cetera. We wanted to get wider wavelength coverage. We wanted to look for variability in the lines because that can also help us understand the flow structure. So we got another spectrum. Um, go to the next slide, 16. And this slide shows, now the old, older 2011 spectrum is, the, is now shown in gray and the new spectrum is in black. And the new spectrum looks very peculiar. When I first saw this, I was convinced there was something wrong with the data, that there was something wrong with the observation, there was a problem with the pipeline reduction. Um, <clears throat> but after much work to exclude other problems, we realized that all of these little ripples, these bumps and wiggles, little spikes, if you look at the bottom panels, little spikes appear that look like narrow emission lines. All of that stuff is real, intrinsic to the quasar. So something happened between our observations. And it's not, it's such a mess, it was very confusing to try to figure out what that is. So it must be many absorption features. What helped a lot then is shown on the next slide, 17. David Rupke, also on our team, um, got a visible spectrum of this quasar just a few months later. And it looks normal. You see H alpha on the right and H gamma on the left. But if you look closely, you see little notches. On the blue side of H gamma, you can see a little absorption notch. On the blue side of H beta, you see a little absorption notch. On the helium-1-5876 line, there's little tiny absorption notches there. The next slide, 18, shows a blow-up of those absorption features. So on the left are the Balmer lines and Balmer absorption, and you also see the helium-1 line and the sodium D lines in absorption. And on the right are a variety of excited state iron-2 lines. So this is completely unprecedented in quasar spectra. The velocity shifts of these features are 1,800 kilometers per second from the quasar frame. The widths of the lines are characteristically about 100 kilometers per second. Um, the excited state iron lines are particularly unusual. Um, if you go to the next slide, 19, I never show Grotian diagrams in talks, but I thought this audience might appreciate that. This is the more uh, Grotian diagram for iron two, and some of the multiplets I've highlighted that we see in this quasar are highlighted in red, multiplet 42, which is famous in emission. But in absorption, you have to really populate the lower state of that, that, those lines to get absorption. And we also see multiplet 74, which is from an even higher state. The lower state energies are about 3.9 electron volts. Um, 
So now go back, uh, so if we go back to our spectrum, it's at 20, our UV spectrum, um, we now know that all those ripples that are shown there are absorption. And it's, it's actually something like line blanketing in a quasar spectrum. Again, it's completely unprecedented and very difficult to do the identifications of individual features. So what I did is just take line lists guided by what we saw in the visible spectrum and overlay that on top of the UV spectrum to look for coincidences. And go to the next slide, please, 21. Um, that's the same plot. You can maybe toggle back and forth between 20 and 21, and you just see the me adding all these uh, line identifications. And the key to that is the color code is that the red markings are things that are not iron two, and everything else is an iron two line. Um, the blue iron two dashed lines are the ground multiplet. The green ones are the next highest energy level multiplet in iron two, and then further excited states up to three electron volts. And then I just stop labeling because it gets too messy. But you can see that. Um, I'll show you another plot in a second, but we did pretty well. And those emission spikes in the lower panel, for example, around 1103 angstroms, there's an emission spike there and other spikes to the right of that that look like emission spikes, what they are in fact are just gaps between the absorption lines. Okay, so next plot um, shows a zoom in of some of this and you can see again how well we did. So this is um, slide 22. Um, there's, a, there's a set of ripples around 1090 angstroms where the, the blue dashed lines are showing where the iron two should be. And uh, we're basically, I think we did really well in identifying these different features. Nickel two, there's excited state nickel two. I think there are many more things not labeled. Um, so it's just it's amazing spectrum, line blanketing in a quasar. Um, the next plot shows, so the next slide, slide 23, shows the line profiles. So I want to talk just a little bit before I conclude with about the physical conditions. Um, the line profiles in the middle panel, notice the helium-2, 5876, and the sodium D lines, the middle column and the top panel there, um, and also other lines of, of iron-2. <clears throat> The next slide, uh, again, Groschian diagrams, it's helpful to look at this just to get a feeling for how exotic this is. On slide 24, you see the Groschian diagram for helium-1 on the left, the full diagram, and on the right are just the triplets. The bottom of the triplet states is that metastable state that um, gives rise to the 10830 line and also 3888. Um, it's, that's, those are the lines that Karen Laley has seen in absorption in some Val quasars. It's not too surprising to see that because the lower level is metastable. We populate that by recombination in a helium-2 zone, and you can maintain some significant populations, but you do need a large column density. The lines we see, though, are 5875 here in the, and 4471 shown in the red box. The lower level of those lines is not metastable. So to maintain a population in that, the lower states of those lines requires very high densities in addition to very large column densities. And I realize I'm running out of time. I'll just show you quickly cloudy results. Um, slide 25. Um, these are plots of, on, on the, Top panels are the ionization fractions and different ions versus depth into the cloud, where the ionizing source is off the, to the left and going towards the right is deeper into the cloud. And in the middle there, you see an abrupt line. That's the recombination edge between two and hydrogen one and helium two and helium one. And the main thing I want to point out here, two, the pair of plots on the left is done at a density of 10 to the six. On the right, it's the same calculation. The only thing that's changed is the density's gone up to 10 to the 10. And I should mention, importantly, 
that to make all of this work, to get the right answer here, we have to use all of the excited state capabilities in Cloudy that includes uh, some of the default and the helium one and helium, uh, uh, helium, sorry, hydrogen one and helium one, the iron two atom and the Chianti database. Um, but if you look at the lower left plot, uh, you see the iron two lines um, in the partially ionized region past the recombination fund uh, shown in blue, multiple at 74 and 42. They're very weak. Uh, these are the line extinction coefficients. But if you go to the right-hand plot at the bottom, increasing the density brings up the strength of those lines enormously. In fact, at those densities, the departure coefficients are approaching unity. So it's basically an LTE situation among these iron two states. Also, if you look on the lower left, the helium one line, 5876, drawn as a solid black line at the bottom of that plot, that line is also very weak. This is a line that does not have a metastable lower state. But when we bring up the density on the right-hand side, 5876, is orders of magnitude stronger than it was at low densities. So these very high densities are required in addition to very large column densities. And uh, the next slide shows the result of a series of cloudy calculations where we try to get a handle on the density um, <clears throat> and ionization requirements to produce the helium one line. So the black contours are the optical depth in the helium one line versus the density and the ionization parameter. And you can see that to get significant optical depths in that line, um, we need to be towards the top of that plot at very high densities. Um, I'll just also mention the green dash lines are then knowing the density, we know the distance from the quasar and those green dash lines are distance from the central emission source. So not only do the densities have to be high, but this has to be buried near, uh, near the quasar. The next slide shows something similar. I realize I'm running out of time. Um, for the lower ionization lines, just look at the bottom left plot. The iron two multiple at 74, again, requires very high densities. That's the black contours. Even more interesting is the sodium one. Uh, that's, that requires high densities to maintain a certain amount of the neutral atom in a partially ionized gas. High densities help enormously, but it requires densities of at least around 10 to the 10 in addition to very large column densities in a partially ionized gas. And I'll just skip ahead then, go to slide 29. So skip one slide, go to slide 29. These very high densities and high column densities and all the different features we see are consistent with looking through one of the broad emission line clouds. It's always been a puzzle why we don't see broad emission line clouds in absorption and the standard picture for that is shown in the upper left plot there from a, a, a paper by Martin Gaskell, where the broad emission line region is sort of blocked from our direct lines of sight to the continuum source by the dusty torus. So we can't see through the broad line region normally because we would have to also see through the dusty torus. And the outflow lines, BALs, are above that where we can see through the outflows down to the continuum source, and that produces absorption. But in this case, in this particular quasar, it, I suspect we might be seeing broad, absorption, broad emission line clouds that are peaking out, and we're looking through some of them as part of the outflow. Um, and my last slide then, just in conclusion, so we find this remarkable transient absorber. That's another thing, it just appeared. We're now watching it to see if it goes away and it, it has in fact faded. Um, <clears throat> it requires very, these, this kind of variability in optically thick lines requires clouds crossing our line of sight. Uh, so the, with transverse motions, very close to the central quasar, large densities consistent with broad line clouds and Possibly like other outflow scenarios, low ionization bowels, low bowels, epi low bowels. Um, so maybe it's not unique. What might be unique here is that the lines are narrow and we can resolve individual features and identify them and do a cloudy analysis to get the physical conditions, whereas normally the lines are too broad and we can't do that. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Okay, we have time for a few questions for Fred. Hi there. It's Martin Ward speaking. Um, I gave a talk before yours about SEDs, and I have a question related to how you calculate the bolometric luminosity for your objects and how secure you are that the proxies you use give you the right answer. Ah, well, we are, we are just winging it, Martin. Um, so uh, the, where I mentioned uh, luminosities was, was for those extremely red quasars. And all I did there is I took the W3 magnitude and converted it to a luminosity assuming a normal, a normal, and you can imagine what that means, um, but a normal quasar CD. So I'm assuming that what we see in the ultraviolet is extremely, but the mid-infrared is our sort of anchor point that that's not affected by obscuration. And then I just tie it all to that. Okay, you have another question here? The, you mentioned the uh, impact of your work on estimating mass outflows and general feedback. Um, what can you say in general about this, about whether really quasar feedback or AGN feedback, uh, whether you're advancing in, in uh, seeing what effect this can have on quenching using these techniques? Right. So that. That would have been an excellent talk unto itself, but I can tell you just in a nutshell, what's changed lately um, in quasar outflow studies is these uh, looking at things like the low abundance ions um, to try to get a better handle on the kinetic energies. And what we're finding is that the mass loss rates and kinetic energies um, typically are high enough to be relevant for feedback. Um, now that's not saying it is directly causing feedback because that the next question is, so we see this outflow coming from the quasar, it's happening usually down at the quasar environment. Is it really disrupting the galaxy? And that's the next step. So that's gonna require more work with IFUs. That's gonna require correlations between outflow properties and things we see in the extended galaxy, like CO blowouts or things like that. That would, that would establish the link between the quasar outflow and something happening in post, and that's still work in progress. Okay, so let's thank Fred again. <laughs> thank you, Fred. Okay, so with this, we, we thank finished, you. Bye -bye. We finished the, this morning session. Now it's time for lunch. All of all of you that have this sort of green tickets, color tickets, today is Monday, <laughs> the green one. The green one is Monday, is, is lunes. The green one is lunes, Monday, Monday, Monday. Okay, and the lunch is going to be served here in the, in the patio near. Gracias.